middle school around like my age when I went to middle school, and it's like so fucking accurate to ha- the hell that was middle school in the late nineties and early two thousands. That like oh, it's been ridiculous. really satisfying to watch. What did I? Uh, what did I watch? Oh, I watched uh, Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. I binged it all in one day. Oh yeah, what'd you think? Um, like I'm so. Are you a fan of Scott Pilgrim? Have you read or watched the movie? I'm familiar enough with the work, but I'm not a fan of it, so... Okay, so then... But I'm not, like, I I don't hate it or anything, it's just not... Didn't connect with you. Well, I'm a, like, I'm a huge fan of Scott Pilgrim. Mm. Like, I've watched the movie, I have the books and all that crap. I've read them. Um, But, you know, I liked, I liked the, the, like, the, it was eight episodes, I liked it. It, it ties really well... Um, basically just go watch the movie and then go watch the series and it, and just like watch the whole thing and it like oh, you're like oh okay it makes sense that was fun hmm. and like that's it like I know there's like a big controversy in the first episode and I'm just kind of like oh no and then I watch the whole thing and I'm like yeah okay cool that was fun <laughs> like it didn't it didn't like take me but it like I don't know I really liked it it really expands upon everyone else. <laughs> What was kind of nice because it, like it's all from Scott's point of view from the movies and the books, and yeah. he's there are times where he's an unreliable narrator and also like he is just a piece of shit human being, mm-hmm. and it kind of it's kind of like him being less of a piece of shit human being by the end of the books. Yeah, he doesn't super resolve himself in the movie, but then again, you only got like two hours to do everything. Yeah, that's the problem I have with trying to adapt a lot of uh, comics. Well, uh, so early on, they tried to compress long form comics into single movies, and it just doesn't work. Didn't work. No, yeah. um, I don't mind if they like. Well, I always think of like the X Men, like the '90s X Men, doing like some of the bigger storylines over, like, the course of the, like, seasons or whatever, and it was like, yeah, okay, this makes sense, and it's also good, because you have time for shit to do its thing. Yeah. I don't know, there's, there's a couple, there's, like, there's media that is good for movies, and there's media that's just good for, like, long-format television series. Like, yeah. if, if there was, I don't know, like, let's, um, like, if they picked, I don't let's, let's just do something easy, like, Lord of the Rings, like, if they're, like, each We'll do, they'll be like, each season is one of the books, and we're going to have three season begins and ends, and we're going to make this whole thing, and it's going to, like, because then it has also a really good ending, like, a lot of the times with TV shows is that they're like, oh, it did really well, well, we got to keep going, we got to keep going, like, ending a show yeah. is super hard and making everyone happy and satisfied. Yeah. Because if it's making a ton of money, well, we're not going to end it. It's making us a ton of money. Yeah. But it all has to end at some point, and it's just like... Give yourself a good way out is kind of the thing. Yeah, shows are getting a lot better at that now. Like, I think the quintessential example of the show that fucked that up, and it's, I, like, I won't talk about it too much because I can talk about this literally for hours for some reason, but, like, the TV show Lost had a really great concept and a really just bullshit execution, and it's aged really poorly, but it Mm -hmm. was, like, when it it walked so that all these shows can run type thing. Yeah, I remember people freaking out about Lost, and it was, like, when I was younger, or, like, when I was a kid, and it's like, did you watch Lost, like, this week's episode of Lost? Like, oh my god, and, like, whoa, what's the mystery? And it's like, I tried, I tried to watch it when it was done years later to, like, get into it, and I watched the first episode, and I was like, yeah, I'm good, close. It's, uh... It's rough. Like, I remember seeing that first episode for the first time, like, when it came out, or shortly after when I got into it, and um, it compared to what TV was like at the time, like, it was just, there was nothing it was like huge. it. It was huge. Incredible. Well, um, the, but, be- the best comparison was, like, Survivor or The Bachelor. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, they didn't, they didn't think they were going to have to finish the show, so they didn't have an answer to any of the big questions, and by the sixth season, you could really tell... <laughs> Yeah, um, what was another? You know, what a show it did itself really well was Babylon Five. Like the writers for that show had an out for every single character if, for any reason, any of the actors left the show. They had a way to write out the character and then write in a replacement. Nice. And so Babylon Five did really well. I'm. I think I messaged you about this, but I'm watching uh, Star Trek Next Gen, and I'm yeah. in season one. And it's just like, oh man, I want to strangle Will Wheaton so hard. <laughs> Yeah, 
I know. I know this shows get this show gets better because I remember watching it as a kid with my dad, and I'm like, I'm just waiting for the Riker beard. I'm like, once he gets the beard, that's when the show gets good. <laughs> that's on. what they say. Yeah. Once you grow a beard, you never grow it back. Wait a minute. <laughs> 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 Hello, and welcome to Long Table. I'm Mass, and with me today is my co-host, Cass. Hello. There she is. Uh, today, we're going to continue talking about magic. This is kind of going to be a little bit of a weird episode, because we're going to um, finish off magic. We kind of stayed up super late last time and just kept going, and then realized it was midnight, and we're like, we should probably go to bed. So this time, we're going to get through the, uh, what is it, the remaining factions. I think there is Wadroon... Old Dominion and City States. We can talk about the magic in there. Um, then we got some listener questions about a month or two ago, so we're just going to go mm-hmm. through those. And do you want to do? Do you want me to talk about Calgary before or after all this? Um, that I don't know. I guess probably we should open with that. Oh, okay. That was, that was the interesting thing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about PB news, rule of the week, and then I guess I'll talk about Calgary, and then we'll go into magic, and then listener questions, and that should be our episode for the day. Yes. I'm just, I don't know. I'm, there's a bit of me what's like, magic and more. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else you don't give a shit about. <laughs> yeah, magic and miscellany. Yeah. Um, so for uh, PB News, there is a bunch of stuff on pre-order. So there's like a bunch of holiday bundles what are we've kind of talked about before. What's like a box with an extra box and you're kind of getting a good deal. They're usually about like 150 I think. I want to say that's Canadian. I I don't know. Because <laughs> it does Canadian American, so we still don't know. It's definitely money. Yeah, it's money. Um, but there's a couple things for pre-order. We got the Artisan Series Female Yarl. So Very it's become the present. Yarl of White Run. The Yarla. The Yarla. Is, is that how it is? The Yarla. I don't know. Maybe. I mean... Well, they're just a Yarl. Like... I think it's yeah. It's interchangeable. It doesn't matter. It doesn't give a shit about your gender. It's like you're a you're a lord well, in no, Nordic you, society. I don't know. Like, I, I, so here's the thing. I don't know anything about anything. I've never been to any um, form of school or have any sort of formal education to speak of. We literally um, talked I'm about not, you going through middle school. <laughs> I'm not literate. Um, no. Literate. Everything. I'm, all my interactions on the Discord are are dictated to me by a person that I pay to do the work, and they type my responses that I speak to them. Um, So I don't claim to be an intelligent person, but I feel like there's probably a feminine form of titles like Jarl and what have you. So if there are any real history pros that listen who can answer that question, then I'm interested to hear what it is and to find a way for it to be wrong if it doesn't align with what I think. Okay, I googled it. What is the female version of Jarl? The feminine form of Jarl, his wife, would most likely be Fior or Fury. Fe- I don't know. It's F U R. Sorry, it's F F R U, and but the U has a weird like comma thing above it, so I have no idea how to pronounce that. I think it's Yarla. There, I sent it to you, so you can. It's <laughs> Yarla. F R U, and it has like a weird comma thing above the U. I don't know what sound that's supposed to make, but. It's, it yeah, translates I'm not to gonna... meaning lady. Mm. So there is a there is a female Jarl title. Like Baron well, so but that's not a female Jarl, that's a Jarl's wife. Oh. So it was the Baron. That's, that's right. Baron Baroness definition. Uh, I'm going to Google The it Baroness anyway. also means his wife or widow of a baron. Hmm. So it's the same thing. <laughs> okay, so when I, I googled feminine form of uh, Jarl, and I got 
uh, Yarlina. But I don't know. No, that's from a Paizo. That's a fuck. Google is so useless now. I, I don't even. <laughs> I'm finished with this. Whatever I said was right. I don't <laughs> no, care it anymore. isn't. You're gonna go to Duck Duck Goose, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just keep googling this until I find. You'll find what you're looking for, and then you'll grab that yeah. one that one paper and shove it in my face for the rest of my life, kind of thing. Yeah, I'll grab onto it and hold onto it until oh I die. Oh my god. <laughs> While Cass is doing that, we also have the Va- Vogni, yeah, Vogni, the Vagni Lord. What the fuck is coming to my mouth? No, the Vogni Lord? The who's the werewolf man with a broken sword? Um, Werewolves, who kind of look pretty sweet. I like the werewolves there. Um, the our- werewolves are pretty good looking, but I'm... If- I don't love the Lord. What? I, don't, I can't remember if we talked about this or not. I don't believe we have. Oh, it's not my favorite sculpt of PBs. It's going be good. I kind of like him. It's a little thriller coded to me. <laughs> kind of reminds me from like a Worgen from WoW. When they were just like, I'm a beast man with a sword. Whack, whack, whack. I get that. See, so that's, I like him. Also, I just want to make you feel bad. He's $40 compared to the Thunder Chieftain's $100 fucking dollars. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Think of, um, the thing is, um, there's enough resin in the Thunder Chieftain that if I lose the match, I can just kill my opponent. Um, <laughs> I can put by... this in my sock and bludgeon them to death. Yeah, like I can, I can literally just hold it in my hand and punch somebody, and they, they'll, I'll probably break my hand, but they'll die and straight up. Every... So, like, I win every every conquest game in the end. Everyone who's listening to this, please. Just lose your game to cast so you don't end up dead by a fucking Thunder Chieftain from a sock. And that's how I take it down to God. <laughs> threaten, threaten people's lives? That was the answer? It's like, well, if I just threaten people with violence, they'll obviously, like, submit to me. There'll be no re- repercussions or anything. Sometimes you win on the last argument of King, sometimes you win on the first one. <laughs> Making threats. <laughs> Making threats. It's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> just, just DQ yourself. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Um. No, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna. Um, I'm not gonna punch anybody with my hand loaded with a thunder chieftain <laughs> unless things escalate beyond what I've envisioned. That thunder chieftain was expensive. I only get one good yeah. use out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And I'll be in America, so like I can't really. I don't. I'm just not uh, financially liquid enough to break my hand in that country either way. So Ooh, no. <laughs> well, I got travel insurance and everything. It'll suck, but I'll be fine. Well, I guess I'll have to get you to do most of my punching when we're over there. <laughs> Am I just gonna get into the back alley fist fights with other conquest players? Like that's the real tournament? Yeah. Fuck, I'm gonna have to like fucking work out way harder than I do already. Yeah. Well, I'll get a lot of practice running my mouth. Oh, you fucking bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh what else is on here? We got the Ironclad Drake and the uh, Drake Rider for the Ray Drake Rider. That's what it's called. Okay, Ray Drake Rider. This thing. Come on, PB website, don't be slow. Yep, <laughs> that's what it's called. And he gets to sit on that thing. So those are coming down the pipeline. I believe the release date for the Drake is December twenty second, so just before Christmas. So I don't know if people are going to be able to get it just before Christmas or if it's going to be like shipped out. Because I know for us, usually things that are like. It releases on this day. We usually get like a week or two after. I've always found. Yeah, yeah. I've never been a hundred percent firm on PB release dates personally, so it's always just my shit shows up. Yeah, and then I get it. Well, I just clicked and opened up the stuff, and it was like release date December twenty second, twenty twenty three. I'm like, oh okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's probably you're probably not getting that one for Christmas, um, but oh. I imagine. It'll show up in your LGS, depending on where you are. I guess maybe if you're in Greece, it might. <laughs> Leandros will hand deliver it to you. Yeah. <laughs> He'll just show up your door at the 22nd and be like, here you go! And he just kind of shoves it in your hands and leaves for the next one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really for people. Otherwise, you might have a bit of a late. Oh, there was a, there was a happy hour the other uh, day, I think. Um, 
We're recording this on the 6th. I think, when the fuck was it? Was it the 30th? They said some things that people got excited about. No, I don't remember any of it. I uh, I was kind of half paying attention. I was kind of busy while it was going on. So I kind of just like threw it on play and was just like, eh, okay, let's see if I pick anything up. But I know they're they're working on some narrative stuff. Um, they showed the pictures for the companion cab and sealed temple. Um... I believe they talked about some rule changes coming down the pipeline in, like, January for, like, city-states and Old Dominion. Don't quote me on the January part. I just know it's, like, city-states and Old Dominion. So that's really nice. Um, There are STLs for faction-specific terrain coming out at some point. So I don't know if those are going to be paid for or they're just releasing to the public. Or, you know, maybe it's, like, five bucks and who cares? Give them the five bucks. So that's kind of cool. Those are kind of like the big things I remember off of it. Yeah, I forgot about the train. That's pretty neat. Um, yeah, I'm pretty into that, actually. If they, I, as you mentioned, um, they, I believe they said, because I didn't watch it firsthand, but from what the discussion I saw, they were going to release STLs uh, yeah. along with it. So whatever form that takes, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty good, because... Um, I don't know, it's just, uh, I, they've probably correctly deduced that you are not going to get more sales by not offering the STLs, and that helps people fill out and make, um, like, I think this is a way also for them to help provide a pathway to making, like, um, legal tables. Mm-hmm. Because they clearly have, and I mean, the tournament packet outlines what it, it in includes but i think they want to have more of a more impactful terrain overall in general even though they haven't released the model table photo to us uh, which i'm <laughs> formally calling them out for um but uh yeah so i mean this is a better pathway to that like if you can just buy a bunch of stuff and print it like nobody actually wants to spend a second army's worth of money on pretend wall segments and um, trees and power turbines with skulls on them. Not that I'm making a specific reference to any um, any, uh, game. any particular, <laughs> but <laughs> um, <clears throat> it, it's a little excessive, and I think, like, so the table like, the tabletop it doesn't necessarily have to be, like be a perfect tiny little world that takes you there, but you need at least enough to facilitate playing the game, so I think uh, any decision that enables that is, is good, and I think that selling STLs is probably, like, if, if they have a thing where you buy one set of whatever the thing is, and then they also give you an STL for it, like, I would buy pr as much of that as I could. Oh, probably, like, you know? like, the QR code is in the box, and you just see people breaking into game stores, ripping apart the boxes to get to the QR code, and then just, like, all the trains, like, fucking all over the floor. <laughs> That'd be That'd be, so I, yeah, if Conquest Mania overtook. Yeah. You know, I mean, I could see like people doing that, like the sculptors for GW doing that for some fucking reason. Sounds about right. Like I wouldn't put it past those people, but I don't. I don't know <laughs> if there's like conquest sculptors yet. Like it, it hasn't hit that um, level of popularity of like. I'm going to go yeah. in and buy all the boxes of phalanges, and everyone will have to buy their phalanges from me. Yeah. <laughs> the greatest conquest sculptor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that's kind of it for PB News. You want to go to our rule of the week? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where the hell is it? It said terrifying. Okay, cool. Found it. Terrifying X. Regiments in contact with this stand, with this special rule, reduce their resolve character characteristic by X, where X is the value in the terrifying X special rule, for the purposes of making morale tests against wounds taken from the regiment. That That's it. Yep, it's just cleave for courage. Yeah, <laughs> cleave, wow, that's actually, like, great. <laughs> um, yeah, um... I don't know. Always ask your opponent if this like a thing is terrifying. If it looks like spooky, some things you're like, is that terrifying? And you're like, no. And then there's other things where like, is that terrifying? And then you're like, yeah. 
Um, when I play Crimson Towers, people ask me if the Ash and Dawn are terrifying, and I gotta be like, no, the Ash and Dawn are not terrifying, it's the Crimson Towers that are terrifying. And then I hit them with Household Knights who have Olafane's Roar, and they're like, those guys are terrifying too, and I'm like, yes, because they have Olafane's Roar. So, just, you know, check with your opponent on those, because it's good to know when your resolve is going to be reduced on top of your defense, because it is kind of a double whammy when you're taking those resolve hits. Um, yeah. Another big one you do have to watch out for with Terrifying is that it's via stand basis. Like, it only follows um, if the stand with that special rule is in contact with the regiment. So if you have, I'm going to use Crimson Towers and Ash and Dawn again. If you have a unit of Ash and Dawn and then you have a Pride Commander of the Crimson Towers who has Terrifying 1 in that regiment, and they charge you, they do a bunch of damage, and you take a bunch of resolve, and you remove the stands in contact with the prior commander, well, you're not in contact with the stand that has that special rule. So now all the other damage coming from the Ash and Dawn and prior commander regiment is no longer um, inflicting terrifying upon you. So there's, there's kind of ways like around it if there's one stand in the regiment who has terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, also, it's not just like all his attacks are the ones that cause terrifying and have to be rolled separately. It's just every, like, it just only checks if, does the stand have terrifying? Yes. Are they in contact with the enemy regiment? Yes. All of the attacks going into you on that roll are the ones that are going to be taking terrifying. Those are the checks. So, um, basically, if you can, Richmond counter the stand, yeah. So if you can remove the stand in contact with the one stand with terrifying and then take the resolve you're not taking terrifying but if it's still in contact guess what you're taking terrifying that's kind of the only like real tech i can talk about with terrifying because you yeah. know like Cass said it's just cleave for your resolve yeah it's um to be it used to be that in 1.5 terrifying would um would it like if you had a terrifying uh stand in contact with a regiment any hits that they took would be subject to that terrifying debuff. Like, so if you had, for instance, an Apex Predator that was um, in combat with um, a regiment, and then you had a unit of blood, blooded uh, charge in as well and start um, kicking the shit out of those guys, whoever they are, um, your blooded attacks would also get the benefit of terrifying under 1.5 rules, but they changed that. Um, to being uh, the terrifying debuff is specific to the stand that um, gives it. Uh, because the um, Apex Predator... Uh, well, I mean, this is just my pet theory. I don't know if this is true. This is just a dumb conspiracy. But I think the Apex Predator keeps having this problem where it becomes too convenient of a buff um, cab. Um, so they keep having to nerf things to adjust that. <laughs> but, um, it has a yeah. good stat line. It's in a... I don't, I don't want to say the Apex is in a weird spot, but it has some, like, really good stats for its price, but it doesn't... It's it's not, like, the Apex monster. <laughs> like, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't do enough, but it does... Like, it has a bunch of really nice things for its price and what it does do. Like, it's such a... It's kind of... Mm. It's I a want, very... I want to say it's weird, but it's not. Like, it's almost, like, has a weird title attached to it, but it's, like... I kind of see where you're going with this thing, but I'm also like, eh. It, it's ultimately, I think, more of a utility piece uh, mm -hmm. in the game, which I'm sure I've talked about in the past. But it's it's totally um, um, it wants to hit a thing after it's been engaged with one of your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Or as a like, it wants to stand beside your slingers and then <laughs> and kill the thing that kills them. Yeah, it's it's totally just like. It's a layering piece, like it's a second wave piece. It, de it never goes in first. Um, but but you did have a very good point there that um, just terrifying only affects um, the attacks generated from the regiment that has terrifying. It doesn't give it to other people. Like that's a really good one to follow and know, because I I still know there's people who get confused by it to this day still. So thank you for picking that one up. Well, I'm so mad about it because it was so good to park the dinosaur in a regiment and then just <laughs> just march charge debuff there, yeah. yeah. Just march charge in and then hit that regiment with someone else and be like, Rah! "Here's a billion attacks of terrifying minus two. Yeah, well, you're too scared of the dinosaur to be tough at these guys. Yeah, jeez. 
Um, Which makes so like from okay, okay, just from an intuitive way, like if a dinosaur is breathing down my neck, yeah, I'm gonna be fucking scared of the dinosaur. And now twenty two orcs run up and are gonna trying to kick the shit out of me with stone swords. I'm not gonna forget that the dinosaurs behind me, like my scaredness, I feel like is only going to compound. You imagine so. the, the the apex just char like march charges, does like three like kills three guys at the trample and is just standing there and you're like, what do we do, sir? We can't. We already activated this turn. <laughs> oh god! And it's just like standing there looking at you, like oh, oh. our only hope is to activate first or have someone come and save us. <laughs> yeah. And then 20 orcs come in yeah. from the side, and all of a sudden you're like, what dinosaur? Yeah, it's like, oh. I'm fine with this. Yeah. Oh, the orcs are way less scary than this fucking big dinosaur in my face. <laughs> yeah, but like... I know. <laughs> if somebody's chasing you with a gun, and then you, you uh, turn a corner and there's a big hole in the ground, like, you're going to be worried about the hole... But you're not going to stop thinking about the guy with the gun who's coming for you, is yeah, my point. That, <laughs> this is compounded <laughs> scariness at this point. Yeah. Every You should have terrifying, and they should have another rule. It's like every time anyone else enters that engagement, they add another point of terrifying, <laughs> even if they don't have it. So it's like terrifying uh, one, terrifying two, plus two, terrifying plus three. It just like keeps growing, and you're like, oh, I'm so spooked. I'm surrounded by all these things. <laughs> I um, I like that a lot. From a like in an abstract way, but then I think about like game trying to keep track of that <laughs> in the game, and it's like hmm. you imagine though, like okay, we got dragon slayers. How are we gonna deal with them? Well, well, and actually, I think they're they ignore terrifying. Do they? I think they might have fearless. Um, we got a bunch of hold things. How are we gonna make the resolve zero? Oh, we're just gonna stack a bunch of terrifying on them. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. just mob them with a yeah. billion dudes and a dino and watch them become resolve zero. So all the hits that go through it kills another guy <laughs> for free. Um, talking about fearless. Fearless is the rule that allows you to ignore the terrifying special rule. It ignores fearsome and terrifying and I'm throwing shit on the ground again. <laughs> okay. and, um, just, just a heads up for fearsome. If a character has the special rule, it only affects the character stand. But if the regiment has it, it affects the regiment. Um. Yeah, and the character only gets affected by fearsome if in a duel. But I don't really think there's many characters with fearsome. I think it might just be a butt covering. Yeah, I think that's kind of it. Do you have anything else to say about terrifying? Like, it's really yeah. No, I mean it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, it's good to have. Oh yeah. It generally speaking, though, it's uh. Yeah, I don't know. It's good to have. It's. Um... I I would like to see something wacky where it's um, a cleave zero regiment. What's like, clash two with flurry, and it's like terrifying three. <laughs> just to be like, every time it hits, it just auto deals another wound because it's terrifying fucking three. <laughs> just to see what would happen. I could totally see that happening in spires. Yeah. Actually, don't don't give spires any love. Fuck those guys. <laughs> If I, I get agree. if I get shot again by marksman clones or, or Vanguard clone infiltrators, I'll lose my mind. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. You want me to talk about Calgary? Yeah, let's hear about Calgary. Okay, you can interrupt me and ask questions whenever you want. So, um, dear listener, there will be bow reports for all my games. Um, I've recorded them all. I just got to edit them and then like put them out there. So. These will come out eventually, probably, hopefully there'll be one or two out before this um, podcast goes out, but fuck if I know. Um, but anyway, so last weekend, December 1st, drove down to Calgary, stayed the night. Uh, I went to the Century Box in Calgary, and I played a local Conquest tournament. It was 1,500 points, and there was 10 players, myself included. There was the there was two vanguards. So they got two they got two vanguards. Um, both fantastic people. There was Liam from uh, Millennial Model Mayhem, who I'll probably throw his his deets for his YouTube channel um, in the description below if you want to check him out. He was there. Uh, really nice guy. He kind of looks like uh, Jesus, so people have been calling him Conquest Jesus. 
um, what I think was really funny, but also <laughs> really great. Um, he, um, he, I gave him a bonk table patch, and in return, he gave me his business card and um, behalets from Berserk. And I'm like, these are sweet. So I have two behalets. So at some point, I might um, paint those up and then kind of string them together and put them like over, uh, what is it, my mirror in my truck or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's something funny to do, but I'm really appreciative of that. And it was really nice of him. Nice. Um, I got to meet uh, one of the Bonk Table locals, or not, I wouldn't say locals, but like a Bonk Table member. Uh, we got to meet Dino. He was super cool. His uh, wife, his significant romance partner, uh, runs Cosplay GS, and that's where I got the Bonk Table patches. Um, if you want a Bonk Table patch, I don't know, message me. I'm like, I'm not, I don't know if I'm like gonna sell these. I'm mostly just like handing them out to people I see in person. So, like, can I have a patch? No, fuck you. <laughs> That's fair. If you, I'll give you a patch. Do you want one for your uh, romantic interest partner as well? They can um, sew it to the dog. She's not very supportive of the things oh. I do. So, oh. <laughs> no, she she is. But um, no, that's okay. Um, just one for me is good. I don't. Uh, I don't think she's really gonna. I um, am <clears throat> spiritually. Uh, 19 years old and punk forever, so I'll always find a way to put a patch on something. But I think my do you, do you have a partner vest? is a little more grown up than that. So yeah, there there are times where I'm like, I'm an idiot. My partner's more grown up for me, and there's other times where I'm like, I am the adult here. <laughs> I've never thought of myself as the adult in any situation. No, <laughs> I could no. I could see why. <laughs> That's rude. It's fine when I say that, but it's rude when you say it. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm not allowed to bother you about your own self-deprecating jokes? Is that it? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, well, then I'm <laughs> sorry for insulting you. Articulated the contours of the double standard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a patch. But... Excellent. Well, that's great, but <laughs> nonetheless, carry on. <laughs> so, that was super cool. Um, so, my... My first game, so, oh, I should just say what I'm playing. Um, I made the list in, like, five minutes, and it was literally Imperial Officer with double time and fire in advance, three units of Merc crossbows, no upgrades, um, a Priory Commander of the Crimson Tower with Olafaint's Roar, two units of Crimson Towers, two units of Ashen Dawns, they're all MSUs with banners, and that was it. <laughs> it took me, like, literally five minutes to make that. Yeah. So I played that into... Um, actually, Liam, who is the Millennial Model Mayhem guy, uh, or Conquest Jesus, as he is now known for for life. Supposedly, they have that framed in like the Parabellum office with his like name is Conquest Jesus. So like, I'm he told me that, and I'm like, well, that has to just hit the world. Huh. Um, <laughs> he he paints way. he paints really well. Like, just just a heads up, like he's he's a really good painter. Um, his army looked mm. beautiful. He was playing spires, and we we played. We pl I don't even know what, what scenario did we play on. Melee. I remember the first round being melee, and it basically he like rushed out super hard, and like grabbed a bunch of zones to score points. I then kind of waited and like we kind of like traded some skirmishing shots between each other. Um, and then once I got my Ash and Dawn on the table, I like start and Crimson Towers. I started chasing down all this stuff and just like blitzing it and murderizing it because he had no sustainability and i kind of tabled him and then for four, three or four turns i sat on the zones and scored everything and won to like 79 to 29 and that was oh, the end of round one yeah that was round one so we had a good game though and like i enjoyed myself he seemed to have a really good time and i would easily play him again great guy um then we had round two so round two, I played the other Vanguard, the guy who was actually hosting the event. Um, he was super nice. It was actually, we were chatting so much that I forgot to take a turn one picture for the battle reports. So I kind of like shifted the camera to take a photo of it. And I just said to myself, I'll just like erase in the teleprompter the regiment that was on for turn two <laughs> to show turn <laughs> one. Because um, it was kind of funny because he was like, all right, turn two, I'm going to roll my mediums. He's like, I'm like, what do, what do you mean? You're playing City States. I'm playing 100K. I got a bunch of lights I got to put on the table. He's like, oh, okay, fine. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put my Merc Crossbows up the table. Um, so he was running City States. 
He had like a big unit of phalanges. He had a big unit of hoplites. He had a unit of like Minotaur Hespis and a uh, Haspian, and I think some Ogmas running around. I ran up my Merc crossbows, shot him a bunch, um, got both my Ash and Dawn on turn three, just kind of ran them up behind the Merc crossbows. He charged him with his hoplites, killed a unit of Merc crossbows. I then side charges hoplites with a unit of Ash and Dawn. I then front charge a unit uh, or the hoplites with my other unit of Ash and Dawn, and I just like wipe out the hoplites. And then he he like gets his mentor Hespians like tied up with my crossbows, some Crimson Towers. After he kills my crossbows, Crimson Towers charge the mentor Hespians. Um, eventually kill them off. Um, his big giant guy with the trident, I think it's called a Hepestus, charges into the Ash and Dawn, does some damage, and I side charge him with another unit of Ash and Dawn, killing it. Then I Spin and side charge the mentor Hespians with the Ash like the Ash and Dawn unit that hadn't gone yet and kill that. So it's like I've gotten through uh so far three side charges off into city states, which means it's like you're doing really well if you're the um, opposing players because city states never wants to be side charged. Mm. Um at one point his uh phalanges like charge into the side of some Merc crossbows. What leaves their flank completely exposed to another unit of Crimson Towers, so I just side charge into him and just like because he's not getting uh, Phalanx, he's Defense 2, Brutal Impact 2, so I bless all my impact rolls and get, like, 16 hits and just rip through, like, six stands of Phalanges with, um... Because each hit is just a kill, and then he has to take Resolve with Terrifying, what's minus one, went over this. <laughs> and it just, like, shreds them all. Damn. So, yeah, he, he basically got all... Four out of his five regiments died from side charging, what was not good for a City States player. Nope. And he was, like, scoring early to begin with, but then, you know, I got on all the zones and just... Um, it basically ended of turn 7, I think, or turn 6 or 7, it was, like, whoever won Supremacy, I won Supremacy, and I had a unit of Ash and Dawn engaged with his Ogma, and I was like, he's like, okay, I'm just gonna call it. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, mm -hmm. We didn't really need to keep going, so then I we tallied up points, and I had a bunch of points. Um, then the last game was 100k into 100k, because of, of course it was. There was a first blood tournament going on as well. There was like 10 guys playing first blood. So in total, there was like 10 people playing Last Argument Kings, 10 people playing first blood. Um, we're playing the finals for our Last Argument Kings. with 100K versus 100K. And in first blood, 100K won. So hmm. in Last Argument, because we're at the finals table, it's going to like 100K is going to win. <laughs> so I guess 100K is OP in Calgary. So if you're playing 100K, go to Calgary. You'll you'll win because their their meta is susceptible to 100k. Um, my opponent, super nice guy, a uh, gentleman named Adam. Uh, he was great. He played a six stand block of Gilded Legion. He played a buff bus of veteran household knights. I think he played like five stands of those guys. Um, he had a Unimer crossbows. Oh, he had like six stands of men at arms with a chapter mage, a water mage, and then like mounted squires running around. And we we're playing on decline flank. So that's the one where you um, pick a zone. Like after supremacy, supremacy phase is done, each player like picks a zone and so no one can score points on that one. And the table was like six obstructions. <laughs> so there was no other terrain except for the six obstructions. So we're trying to like get around everything. And there was, like, one long, like, skull thing, and I couldn't shoot over it into the side of these men-at-arms. I was like, ugh. And I kind of, like, stumbled on myself at this point, because I was kind of getting, like, hungry and a little bit tired, and I'm just, like, not really scoring points. My opponent's, like, killing stuff. I gave up a unit of Ash and Dawn for free, like, didn't get really anything out of them. Um, and it kind of ended with my opponent, uh, his right flank collapsed, so his men-at-arms with the chapter mage and the... Mounted Squires finally died, and I was scoring points over there. Um, the left flank, he just had Guild of Legion Household Knights left. I had a unit of my crossbows, Ash and Dawn, and Crimson Towers. Household Knights killed Crimson Towers. Ash and Dawn um, and Merc Crossbows put Guild of Legion down to, like, the character and, the stand, and one stand left. Uh, Household Knights get into the behind of the Ash and Dawn, do some damage, but then Ash and Dawn finish off the Gilded Legion. And he came off the objective... And I got on to the scenario elements, so I started scoring points, and I started, like, bringing it back. And we went all the way to turn 10, and I... My turn 9, we were tied, and there was nothing he could do to put his, like, marker on that would stop me from winning, because I just had to score one of these scenario elements. 
but we played it out and the game ended with um he had three stands of household knights left i had i think one stand one or two stands of ash and dawn left a unit of merc crossbows with my imperial officer and a unit of crimson towers and they were all sitting on zones like scoring so mm. i like outscored him and won the thing and yeah then we went for beer and pizza and talked about conquest so that was really fun Nice. Yeah, and then I drove home on Sunday. That was also really fun. Also fun. Yeah, 13 hours later, got home. Good times. Yeah. That's kind of like the quick quick and dirty of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I had a great time. Everyone there was super nice and friendly. Um, everyone, like, it was, just, it was just a good time, and I really enjoyed myself and would would go back if, um, if they do another tournament. Like, super easy. I would just drive out there and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd uh, like to try and make it out next time, but unfortunately it didn't work this time for me, but it sounded like it went well. Yeah, it was really fun. Oh, do you, um, <laughs> do you want me to tell you what our uh, our name means in Britain? Uh, yes. Okay, so there was another, one of the gentlemen uh, there who was playing was from Britain, and he was super nice, super cool guy. He, <laughs> he was like, hey... You're the bonk table guy. I'm like, yeah, I am. And he's like, oh, it's sweet. I watch your stuff. I'm like, oh, thanks, man. He's like, how'd you get the name? And I and I, I kind of told the story. So there's this um, there's this web based program called War Table, and I played a lot of Mark III War Machine on it during the pandemic. And then I started getting into Conquest. And I'm like, man, I wonder if you could play Conquest online. Like War Table would be a great thing to play it on. So I talked to the guys who were um, kind of doing it all. And I was like, hey, can you, like, figure this out? And they're like, oh, we'll find out. So they talked to the developer, and it was basically, like, they couldn't do wheeling. Like, everything else worked except for wheeling. And it was like, okay, well, it's called War Table. And then I wanted to make, like, I wanted to make battle reports and put it up on YouTube. And I was like, well, I need a name. And I was thinking of calling it, like, Conk Table, because that was the joke to try and get, like, Conquest on War Table was to call it Conk Table. But I didn't want to call it Conk Table, because Conk Table sounds weird. And then I was like... Well, I need a name, but I don't want it to be like serious because I'm not a serious guy. I I want to be funny, so I I thought of like the the horny bonk meme with like the dog and the bat, like just like hitting him over the head, like go to mm-hmm. horny jail. And so I'm like, oh, bonk table sounds good. I'll use that. And I got some feedback from a ton of people, and they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And I'm like, yeah, first try, done. So I'm talking to this guy, and I tell him that story, and he's like, you do know in Britain, like bonking means sex, and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> like, I lost my shit because it's, like, <laughs> the YouTube channel and the podcast are called Sex Table. And I'm like, yes, perfect. And and then we were joking around about, like, oh, man, if I ever do a convention and call it... Because I was going to call it Bonk Con. It's like, <laughs> man, there's going to be people there bringing their uh, toys and it's not going to be the same toys that I'm bringing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I mean... We can, we can have uh, separate sides of the convention center. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know what though? As somebody who owns a sex table, it's good Wait, I what? Think that we have uh, representation in the community. So, Jesus Christ! Um, good thing I put a sp- explicit down for all these. <laughs> um, no, that's funny, but at the same time, though, like on a long enough time scale, everything becomes slang for sex. So, like, you can't worry too much about that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm trying to not call my shit sex, and it's like, no matter what country I go to, it means sex in some country. It's like, eh, fuck it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's Calgary. I had a good time. Well, you know, Calgary is well known for being the the place where you let the good times roll, so... Yeah. They also just have, like, more war gaming going on than our city. Mm. Yeah. That's um, fair. Yeah, it is fair. Um, do you want to talk about magic, and then after we're finished up with Drew and Old Dominion and City States, we'll go on to... Oh, I'll dig through the listener questions. Yes. Okay. I'm just gonna go... <laughs> I'm uh, excited, because we haven't discussed or rehearsed these listener questions. No, so. But I, I am allowed to veto the if one of them is too weird, and you are allowed to argue to get the veto change if it makes enough sense. That was that was the rule that we made. So yeah, that'll be interesting. So we'll be good. Uh, Wadrun, Wadrun, Bufaction. 
Get yeah, any wizards um, in Madroon? This is all you. Yeah, it will be in just one second, because it turns out that's one of the army lists that I didn't have up in a tab. <laughs> one second. I get to drink water because I've talked too much. Water rules. Kicks mm-hmm. ass to stay hydrated. Hear that, kids? It's hip to drink water. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Long table tip. Don't forget the wet stuff. Oh my god. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesus. That's like, weirdly enough, a King of the Hill reference. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll, we won't spend too much time on it. Um, Can I tell you my favorite King of the Hill joke? Yeah, hit me. It's when Hank... Um, he has to use WD-40 on, like, a door, but then the cap won't come off, so he pulls out a smaller can of WD-40 to WD-40, the larger can of WD-40, so that he can WD-40 the door. That's a good one. Yeah, that's my favorite um, <laughs> Key of the Hill joke. I have a hard time choosing. A f- uh, Cassandra fun fact is I actually, um, there's... One thing that I have an encyclopedic knowledge of is the television show The Simpsons. Another thing I have an encyclopedic knowledge of is the television show King of the Hill. But that doesn't make any sense because I'm from Canada, so I really <laughs> have no frame of reference for a sitcom about Texans. But nonetheless, that's not what this sitcom is about. Um, but stay tuned for my si- for my podcast, Queen of the Hill, where I watch and comment on every episode. No, that's not going to happen. Um, anyway. <laughs> What room spells? Okay. So luckily, there's only three, so it's really quick to get through. Yeah. Um. So there's um, cacophony, which is the first spell. It's got a 12 inch range. Uh, it's attunement four scaling. Target regiment may not resolve draw events until the end of the round. Um, which is a great effect in theory, except that you're giving up a lot of tempo. And um, kind of telegraphing potentially what you're going to be doing that turn if you're turning off a specific regiment's draw events and they nothing is is happening to them actively. Just as a for instance, I mean that's kind of a niche case, I guess. But either way, um, having to activate your character to cast the spell when you're within twelve inches of a regiment is kind of not great kind of asking for it yeah so it's i mean if like the in theory turning off draw events versus it's you know what actually it's only about a five out of ten spell even in the best case scenario because turning off some draw events is good but like this aside from saving yourself from aura of death there's not really yeah but aura of death isn't a draw yeah that's not even yeah it's not a draw event so that's not even correct um so there's really the one good example that I had. Um, this you like, use, use this on Bastion. Yeah, like Bastion or, or, or like or... over uh, overcharge from the Dwight Home Hellbringer Drake. Like that's that's literally the yeah. only two reasons I would see you to use this, and it's like why? <laughs> yeah, but then you're just setting up the regiment that is that the caster is nestled in to get just um, messed up. Yeah, like. This is asking, like, I cast this on the regiment so they can't do their bastion. <laughs> and then somehow I got charged <laughs> and then was on yeah. my ass. And it's like, you're just asking for trouble. Yeah, it's it, you have to be too close for it to be even worth it if it's going to work the way that you want it to for the most part. Yeah, I don't, I've, I don't feel like this spell gets used. No, I've never had a reason to use it. Um, there's really only one spell that you use as Wedrune, which we're about to discuss. Oh, um, do you want to? Oh, do you want to do dissociation first so we can end on the good spell? Yeah, we might as well. Okay. Let's um, end on the good so, next one is dissonance. Um, so that's range self. Um, attunement four. Until the end of the round, each time an enemy spellcaster attempts to cast a spell onto a regiment within 12 inches of this caster or attempts to cast a spell while within 12 inches of this caster, you may discard two chant markers from the sequence and cancel the effects of that spell. Here's the thing. I feel like chants are better than get rid of spell. Yeah. I feel the only time you'd want to do this is if you know you are going to get blasted by a Dwight caster and you have no reason to continue chanting for the rest of the turn. But even then, it's going to double cast, so like you're not even really mitigating all that much. Well, get four chant tokens and start <laughs> discarding, damn it! 
yeah, that's the only way. But um, it's uh, what do you say about this? It's got all the same problems as cacophony and more, um, because now you're not only are you losing activation tempo, but you're losing chant tempo. Um, mm, I feel like the tokens are still way better than dissociate. Yeah, I would rather. Dissociation. There we go. I said it. I'd rather get the tokens and, and do even a tier one. Any tier one chant is better than the effects of the spell, for the most part. I so. feel like it had use back in 1.15, but I don't really see it. Because I think it lasted uh, longer, like, until the character activated again. So you could cast yeah. it at the end of your turn and then, like, spam chanting t or, like, chants when you needed to, like, get rid of spells. But now that it's until, like, end of round, it's like, eh, it doesn't really stay around long enough to get all the full benefit yeah it's like too much yeah, setup right. yeah exactly it's too much opportunity to get punished for not very much payoff um but that takes us to crescendo which is almost the inverse of what makes these spells um bad uh so crescendo is range self uh attunement four you get a conquest chant marker in the sequence, uh, you reveal your next command card. If it belongs to a regiment, you draw that command card and the regiment activates immediately. Otherwise, you return it to the top of the command stack. Regiments activated this, activated this way do not add a chant marker to the sequence. Um, so the spell kind of has two modes depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so you can either, like the most, so the easiest way to do this is that you're running Chosen the Conquest you have the um, Scion because of that, and you want to guarantee that they always do a Tier 3 champ. Well, the way to do that is to activate your Scion, Crescendo, and then have the uh, Chosen be the next card. Um, it's kind of overkill, because you, you can almost... For, for a Tier 3 champ, do you need two tokens or three tokens, plus Fnatic? So you only need two if they have Fnatic, because Fnatic gives you another token. So the, you only chant Tier 1 or Tier 3 with uh, Fanatic Regiments because they'll always uh, go one up and uh, if they're Tier 3 they just end Fanatic, then that's... Or sorry, if they're three cards or three tokens in Fanatic, then they'll always activate Tier 3. And if they're not, then they would only activate Tier 1. Tier 2 just always... Just rolls into tier three for them so okay, anyway um it's kind of overkill to do it that way but you also get a slight tempo advantage if that's the way things are working out and you need that um to skip and then get that card activated but otherwise if you want to play it a different way if you just want an extra token um, because you're activating on the scion and you're not going to lose the chance that you have in sequence um you can have him activate or her now that you have your choice of model um you can have them activate uh produce their own token then crescendo make another token draw a card that um character yeah or whatever like something that's going to be a dead draw mm -hmm. and then you get that extra card of course then you're sacrificing tempo that way so it's kind of yeah sometimes you great. sometimes you want to stall sometimes you gotta stall and you're like come on come on do it come on you're like you gotta yeah. be the Joker from the Dark Knight walking up to Batman. You're like, do it! And you're like shooting your Tommy gun at him. And he's like, ah! And he like throws his motorcycle at some henchman. I definitely find now, actually, this is a bit of a digression, but I think it merits mentioning that in my games recently, I'm finding that my character cards, like my dead draw cards, are they like they move through the deck over the course of the game. Like what? You At the start of the game, you're putting them up front. In the middle of the game, you're putting them in the middle. And at the end of the game, you're putting them at the end. Yeah, like, usually there's a point where I want to have as much of a delay for, like, my shooters and, like, my counter chargers and my backline stuff so that I know what the board state is, is going to be like before I make choices with them. Um, so, but then there's other stuff that needs to, like, either activate so that it doesn't die immediately at the very beginning of the turn or, like, needs to get in position or things like that. So I'll usually, by, in the middle turns of the game, I'll have, like two or three regiments right at the top that need to do something immediately and then as many characters and dead draws and, and like doesn't matter either way type draws in the middle as I can and then the bottom of the deck stuff at the bottom and then by the end of it um, Just they're go usually time. yeah I'm trying to get everything that does stuff doing stuff as quickly as possible so my characters are usually at the bottom just setting up that tier 3 or tier 
two um, chant at the start of the turn by being at the bottom of the deck. I do the same thing for all the same reasons. Like, I've been doing it for quite a while. And it's just how the game kind of goes with the tempo and the flow of the game itself where it, yeah, you like because I find near the end of the game um, especially if I'm winning or if I'm losing, it doesn't even matter um, stuff is engaged and stuff is about to be charged or do charges and I want them to go and get that stuff off before they kind of get bogged down, like I don't need to stall, I need to get going while in the middle of the game, like you've said like I'm usually shooting Merc crossbows off at, or there's like maybe one important charge I want to get off first. And then it's like, there's that character break in the middle of the deck. Cause yeah. I'm usually like bringing, I tend to bring regiments on um, last just because I know where everything is. So I can set up like proper counters. Yeah. So it's like think like shooting and things that need to get gun get, yeah, get done right at the top character break. Stuff that can just wiggle around. Um, stuff that's coming on from reinforcement. That's like the middle of the game. While the start of the game, like turn one and two, is just like character, character. Okay, now Mark Crossbow. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, that's another thing that I'm finding as well, is where my shooting moves throughout the game has uh, changed a lot in my more recent games, where in the beginning there, it's a priority activation before the engagements really start to happen and we're still in those setup turns. And then. Um, Generally, as the game wears on, provided they survive that long. But usually, when you're running slingers, they're they're gone or they're in melee by turn four or five at the latest. So they're there for a good time and a long time. But uh, up until that point, like they start to move further and further down the deck, just because like I need to know if they have to move back or not. I need to find a space for you guys. Yeah, so, I've gone kind of crazy. Like my latest list, I'm running the my range unit like five wide including the character which is kind of stupid but it hasn't failed me yet. oh man or madame you know <laughs> like that's if you ever look at like people who like put a lot into range units especially like um restricted options quality shooting stuff they'll like throw four or five stands especially if you look at the spires players when they play uh marksman clones they'll throw in like four or five stands like i think i was playing those longbows at one point into you that was like two units of five <laughs> that were just like, yeah, but -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. you're like, Oh my God, <laughs> just creating arrows. Super annoying. Um, I... but like the, that level of quality shooting that is safe and, or if you can make it safe. Yeah. Put some extra stands in there because you're just going to end up with more hits. What can cause more damage. And you'll actually start putting a significant chunk into regiments and might be able to kill a regiment like an MSU over the course of two turns or even in one turn, if you have enough, barrage like yeah. five to six stands of marksman clones uh have just like slaughtered like an msu of merc crossbows uh men at arms like it's just like oh my god like household knights you're just like losing like a horse and a half and it's like oh this sucks yeah that's kind of the like i didn't just because i'm particular about what characters i run because i'm brain poisoned i don't like running the predator um because that's uh, a slot that I could be using on a cooler character model. Um, well, also, like, the Predator's Warband is kind of, like... I'm not going to say he's messed up, but he's, like, it's too many lights. <laughs> and some other stuff. It's very light-centric. Like, you yeah. can't... It's not really what you want to make the core of your army around, necessarily. But I'm actually finding that it was kind of the juice for this list that I've been running lately. And, um... Because he gets, he has easy access to um, Raptor Riders, which you usually want to get in there, um, and but you don't want to give up a restricted slot to give them or to get them. Um, he's got the packs, which I'm a huge proponent of and always have been for the two weeks that I, Cassandra, have been doing this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, the Slingers, which I would do, I wanted to be like, well, we don't need the best shooting unit in the game to be good, but we do. Yeah. <laughs> At least um... in my experience. I mean, I'm not a very good player, so that's part of it. But um, the it does help. And the thing, the the reason why I I went on this long winded path is that um, the cool thing about five units, or four stands of slingers and a predator with Kiss the Dillasaur all having Flintnapper on them is um, the your opponent basically has to do something about it. So once you've got that 
reality acknowledged, then you can sort of formulate your play around that and, and dictate, you know, the flow of play in that way. And that's good. Like, I know that good players understand that intuitively, but I'm not one, and I just figured that out. So I figure maybe there are some other bad players um, who aren't brave enough to go on a podcast and say, I'm lousy at this game. <laughs> they'll hear it and go, well, now well, I'm going to be a little less lousy at this game, which I'm not, because I have complicated... Uh, denial. Can I at play in my psych? You know what? That's I'm, them saying that. That's yeah, that's them. I would. You know what? I would take actually. Hmm. Mounted predator. Fuck the foot one. Get the guy on the raptor. I um. He just gets hunt, rap, uh, raptor riders, and he just rides around with the like the raptor crew, and then he takes like an apex or something or a quaddle. Oh, you can so... take a contour with him. Holy fuck! You take mounted predator. Raptor Riders, Tontor, done. Well, it's already and then he easy gets enough fire to get in a... Oh my god, you could Fluid Reform a Fire in Advance? No, this is fucking sweet. It's not bad. Um, the way I play Raptors, it's not good to put a character with. <laughs> no, because you you like to put your Raptors in your opponent's face and be like, come on, deal with me, deal with me, and it's like, fine, I'll deal with you, and then they kill your Raptor Riders. Generally, but it's been working out for me lately. Um, in the game I played most recently against Spires, actually, they get, they had a big line of quality shooting and uh, put it out on the board early enough that um, originally I was going to pull my Raptors back and play conservatively with them, but I threw them into the shooting, and that did multiple really great things for me. So I um... I'd say... On, at Calgary, the reckless I, plan works one out of fifteen times, and when it does, it feels like <laughs> it worked fifteen out of fifteen times. It always works. Sixty <laughs> percent of the time, it works one hundred percent of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, in Calgary, I actually chased down a unit of marksman clones with a unit of Ash and Dawn because I was like, "Fuck these things! They need to die." That's fair. And then I killed the ball, and I was like, "Yes, good." <laughs> Actually, I think the Mounted Predator with the unit of Raptor Riders taking a Tauntor as a Restricted is actually a pretty sweet warband. And then you it's just bad. take fire in advance so the Raptor Riders can, like, fluid formation, go backwards, shoot out of their butts, and then march away because they, like... Their move, shooting is so shoot, bad. I, just, I think like, you're really... I think you might be mythologizing the, yeah, their probably. shooting because it's two shots a stand at volley two yeah so here's the thing like you well you get within 12 now no because no. you need to keep moving yeah it's too short the like so uh... with fluid formation and fire in advance like you'll get one turn of take aim shooting but it's just going up to no you know... I, I think you you can't and like this raptor rider unit very much wants to get within 12 fluid formation 180 shoot out of their butts do some damage walk away eight and you just keep yeah. doing that to, like, some melee regiment that chases you around and back into your lines. You just run back into yourself, and you're like, here, we dragged this melee regiment across the table, and if they didn't follow us, well, we're just going to keep shooting at you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh... No, it's, um, the way I, like, the way I've been running it is having the um, Predator and the Slingers and then taking the upgrades so that they make Conquest tokens, so that way, while they are alive, they're hoping to smooth out my chance. Yeah, that's that's and, fair. Uh, you know, it's I'm uh there's still a couple scenarios where you get where you lose points for or where they gain points for killing characters. So trying to be conscious of that and not just give up my characters like they're nothing. Although to me they're nothing. So so I'm a callous callous leader. Yeah. Um does Vision of Conquest do anything? No. Do you want to talk about the magical artifacts in Madroon? The two of them? Yeah. They're kind of shit. <laughs> <laughs> why? All right. Tell well, us, tell us about it, it and then why. Yeah, so Essence of the Phenopterics. Wait, you can say 20 that points. Word? Yeah, Phenopterics. Or phenom <laughs> phenopterics, I guess. But I would pronounce the P, personally. I don't know. I guess you could argue. Whatever, Phenopteryx. Um, this character stand increases the range of all of its spells by 6 inches. Spells with a range of self are unaffected. If the effect of any of its spells uh, indicate a range, increase that spell's range. Is that spell's effect range by 6 inches. Great. 
So, so 20 points only... to make it so that you can c- cacophony people out inches. of charge range. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. There we go. So The secret can- uh, c- cacophony <laughs> tech right there. Yeah, except that I can think of, like, at least five, ten different ways that you could spend 20 points better in the faction. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's a tough sell. Um, the other one is Primordial Splinter at 20 points. Character stand gains um, Priest plus X, special rule, where X value is equal to the number of chant markers in the sequence. So, ironically, um, or I guess fittingly, would be the the more correct term to use. Um, this has the dissonance problem, where you would rather have those chants chanting for you, um, or chant markers rather than because this the like I feel like primordial splinter incentivizes not chanting so that you get like I guess maybe with drum beast, then you've got. But what are you getting? A best case scenario, you're going up to uh, priest what um... seven plus. One from Arcane, so that gives you... Uh, well, uh, uh... What the fuck is it? The thing is, you don't need to. You need two oh, successes. There's, here, look, and, there's, <clears throat> in Under Arcane, there's one voice. When this character stand performs a spellcasting action, add a number of dice to the spellcaster will equal to the number of chant markers in the sequence. You can yeah, double so dip! A, <laughs> you can yeah, double that's a dip. better one that you can take, but for 15 points, you can take Focused and never fail a spellcast. Yeah, no... <laughs> Just take focus on your four dice. You only need two successes to get your crescendo off. Yeah, I, I've taken focus on the scion to crescendo, and I can tell you from my direct experience, my lived experience, that every crescendo went off. There was no risk of failure well, whatsoever. You're, you're a two minute four. You have a two third chance of succeeding on four dice with a reroll for two of them. Like, you're getting this. Yeah. If you don't, uh, I'm sorry, the dice hate you. Go get new dice. Yeah. Um, Magus is not for us. Um, uh, there's no reason to spend 20 points on that. Um, nope. But Magus is one of those, is a 1.0 arcane upgrades where everybody, every faction just kind of got the same ones and they were more the mastery upgrades were a little more general and a little more sort of like toolkit type modifications that you could make to characters at least that's was the read that i had on them and the arcane ones i think show the most of remains of that design ethos yeah and especially magus um there's just no reason to you're never going to be what cacophonying a size nine like a nine stand block what? of who's carls of, like, of gilded legion to deny did i call in his bastion <laughs> yeah <laughs> on his like twelve stands of fucking gilded legion, he's like, "Yeah, come at me." <laughs> yeah, no, no reason to take it. Um, generally, so, so Wadrun have one good spell. Um, I guess they're not supposed to be a caster faction. My cute little joke that nobody seems to appreciate quite as much as I would like is that um, Wadrun should get a direct damage spell called Staccato to be consistent with the music and sound. Uh, naming convention of the faction so um, if PB devs are listening to this listen to this <laughs> um, but uh, yeah our, our spells are suck they're not good um, well, overall like crescendo uh, is amazing crescendo, yeah, crescendo, the other you take it for crescendo wordless. that's it yeah we have, we have a spell is mm-hmm. essentially what it comes down to and it's a great spell like you, there's utility in it for anyone like if you are an enjoyer of getting chance off. Crescendo is great. If you are a tempo acceleration enjoyer, tempo is great. Um, or crescendo is great. Um, yep, yeah, super good spell. Everything else, go to hell. Eat shit. Eat, eat shit. <laughs> uh, Not to put too fine of a point on it. But... Yeah. Um, cool. Should we go to Old Dominion then? Yeah, like that's we've kind of. Yeah, I feel like we're good with the Druid because it's it's really just cres- the cres- what? Uh, crescendo. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, what else can you say? Uh, so Old Dominion, you got two spellcaster characters, and then you got two spellcasting units off the top of my head. I think that's the Maurice and the Curies. 
for the first spellcaster, we got the Archimandrite. I'm going to start with his Supremacy ability because he allows you to ca uh, perform a free additional spellcasting action. Um, he cannot cast the same spell twice, uh, more than once per round. Um, and he can also activate the Supremacy until the end of round to reroll any number of dice when performing a spellcasting action. So he gets like one turn of he's probably going to hit you with whatever damage spell he has. Where no, where is it? Dark Immolation? No, that's Aura of Death. Fuck. Unholy Blasphemy? I'm trying to find it. Eh. He's probably going to hit you with like a big Unholy blas uh, Blasphemist. Baham Am I saying this right? Baptist? Um, yeah, it's Bat. Unholy Baptism? Yeah, Unholy Baptism. Thank you. I'm like, what the fuck am I reading? <laughs> um, I sound things out. <laughs> so if it isn't like, if the word doesn't sound out the same way it is said, then I fuck it up. Um, we can start here, so with Unholy Baptism. Um, it's range 12, Arcane 3 with Scaling. You inflict one hit per success on target enemy regiment. These hits have the Armor Piercing 1 special rule. Sweet. Um, he's a pre-6 base, so with his um, Arcane Retinue, he's going up to like pre-7. Um, he gets minus 2 for Scaling that he probably wants, and his Auto Success, what's probably good for him if he wants to just spam out Unholy Baptisms. Um, because this spell is affected by scaling, so probably going to tier 2 is actually good for this guy. Um, yeah. What else is here? What is under Dark Blessings for this guy? I want to check him out. Oh, he doesn't have Focused. Ooh. I think they have a different kind of Focused. Um, he then has Hazel's Touch. Target Friendly Regiment heals 1 plus X wounds, where X is the current tier of Dark Power Pool. So, if he's the Warlord, you're getting like 1 plus... I don't know, like... I guess one, so two, three, and four. So not a huge amount. I know um, old Dominion players will basically, like, we'll get to the Hero Deacon, but the Hero Deacon is killing a stand, and then the Archimandrite is healing back a stand, and it'll just do that to a unit of Legionnaires to generate Dark Power Points. Mm -hmm. um, we got Dark Immolation, which is, gives you, gives a friendly regiment or of death plus X, where X is the current tier of Dark Power Pool. Um... Any regiment affected by the spell and ha already has Aura Death, um, uh, special rule is limited to a maximum of Aura Death 5, so you can't go past 5. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Blasphemous Power. Target friendly regiment counts as being in the effective Dark Power Pool tier higher than it is. Okay, so that's pretty good. The spell cannot grant the tier 4 Dark Power Pool to the regiment, only the Stratagos Auxiliarch um, can. Or, back to regiment. So it can't give you tier 4 unless the Stratagos or Ziliarch is the Warlord. Um, if they're already under the effect of the highest possible Dark Power Pool tier, they gain Fury and Decay 2 special rules. I I don't know if Flurry and Decay 2 <laughs> is like a great <laughs> thing to have when you're maxed out. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like one regiment can get something done. I think you want to put this on the Cataphractoid if they need to go in a little earlier and you're not at Dark Power Pool like 2 or 3. Yeah. Um that's kind of him. He gets a double cast. So a lot of times I see like unholy baptism and Hazel's touch being cast, so he like damages some people, heals. Um he has a yeah. build. I just want to go down in here. Um I'm just going to go into his dark blessings really quick under arcane. So, he, there's Unholy Mastery. When this character stand performs a spell cast action, the spell is successful with four more successes. Then the character stand may perform a free additional spell casting action once that spell is resolved. The character stand can't cast the same spell more than once. Um, this effect can only be activated once per activation, regardless how many spell casting actions this character stand may perform each activation. So, could you get three off if he's the Warlord? So, you get your two and then Unholy Mastery for a third? Mm. so like you can't spam it on itself like if you cast um, unholy baptism get four successes and you can't be like well I got four successes um, now I'm going to cast the Healy spell oh I got four successes now I'm going to cast the aura of death spell so I think that's preventing that but I think you can totally do unholy mastery for an additional success and scholar of the profane uh, supremacy as an additional cast because it's a free additional and you can do as many free additionals as you want. Yeah. <clears throat> it looks like you could definitely, but I mean, uh, once you're at four, yeah, I mean, you can cast all the spells that you have, and then that's it. So. 
Well, you can only get three, so you're gonna be missing oh, one yeah. of these spells. But like, that's okay. You only need the two anyway. Yeah, so. you only you only need Hazel's Touch and Unholy Blasphemous uh, Baptism. Like, <laughs> if he's not the Warlord, I could see maybe going and grabbing that. If he is the Warlord, you don't grab that. It's not worth it. Um, yeah, he's got the Dark Shepherd. May select a friendly regiment with 12 melee, destroy one of its stands. Oh, this is how you generate dark power pools, so he, like, you draw into them. Or the character stand may select immediately. Uh, this just talks about how wounds. Um, you generate dark power pool as normal. Yeah, it's a draw event. Once the pair stand uses a draw event, no other character may use the draw event again. So you just put Dark Shepherd on someone. Usually it's, like, the hero deacon, and you just kind of bounce back and forth of the Archimandrite. Um, someone killing someone with Dark Shepherd and then the Archimandrite healing them back with Haziel's Touch and then continuously killing off the regiment like that. Yeah. Um, period, you can only... Oh, Devote to Haziel. The character's enemy rules uh, results of six for performing a spell casting action. So he doesn't have focus, he just gets to reroll all results of six. That's... So, it's same thing, 15 points, so... Not as good. <laughs> yeah, but it's... Instead of... Like, if you have, like, more than multiple sixes... Like, if you roll four sixes, then you get to roll re-roll four dice. Yeah, it is not as good. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's something in here that basically allows you to get more wizard for, um... Uh, or more priest, depending... Yeah, here we go. Sorry, it's under arcane, under treasures. I just want to bring this up because I want to talk about a build with this guy. You get consecrated my, uh, Miri... The character stand gains the priest X special rule where X is the empowerment tier of the dark power pool. So you gain a point, it's 25 points. Mm -hmm. um, so he can be able to priest, he's six base, arcane one to seven. Um, you get to tier three, so seven plus three is arcane ten. If you have an auxiliary warlord, you can get to arc, uh, dark power pool tier four. So you can be like a priest 11 with an mm -hmm. unholy baptism with like re roll any sixes <laughs> and just like they call him the Gatling gun. <laughs> because <laughs> like, like you just fucking unloaded to somebody yeah, um like... not not as powerful as the dweg one but it exists and is kind of funny to use and i would suggest every old dominion player to like pull it out of their box every once in a while and try it out see how they like it mm -hmm. but i i think a little bit of it is an overkill if you're going down that route <laughs> to get it yeah. all operational yeah, that's a lot. It is a lot, but it's very funny, especially when he uses... Well, he wouldn't have a supremacy if he was Priest 11, but it's just very <laughs> funny. I just wanted to bring that up. Like, the, the Gatling gun Archimandrite, as it is called. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, oh, for, for the... I'm just going to talk about his arcane upgrades. Um, Unholy Sacrament. The character Sam may select a friendly regiment in the warband as target of other spells and have the range other than self. That regiment would be normally outside the spell's range. Yeah, I don't really care for that. <laughs> That's kind of uh -huh. like, oh, I'm just going to heal this guy. Yeah, mm. yeah uh, that's really it. Um, Hero Deacon, he's got two spells. He's got Dark Supplication. Place one power, point, power token in either the Dark Power or the Fallen Pantheon's res, uh, respective empowerment pool. So you just generate Dark Power. Um, it's Attunement 2. So you kind of want to get two successes. That's actually... Really tough. You have to get two successes on two and two. You are priest five though, yeah. so maybe you want to take arcane one with your hero deacon just to get him up to priest six. Um, and then lastly, he has black flame. Uh, course, coruscation. He infects one hit per success to target enemy regiment. In addition, infect an additional plus X hits where X is the empowerment tier of the dark power pool. I don't mind that. It is a scaling one. So, if it's a small regiment, you don't have to worry about scaling, but, like, it is also 2 and 3. Um, so, you're kind of, like, if you're already tier 3, you're automatically going to do 3 hits plus the 2 if you succeed. So, you're doing, like, 5 hits minimum. That's not yeah. bad. Especially on a hero deacon who's just like, I'm a wizard. Or, he's not a wizard. He's a priest. <laughs> he's just <laughs> he's just the, the priest. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I don't... What else? Uh, I do want to mention he does have very some specific... Upgrades. Um, when a hero deacon character completely destroys a friendly regiment as a result of the Dark Shepherd ability. Oh, this is why you put Dark Shepherd onto the hero deacon. It's because for the uh, Viticum. It's 20 points. Uh, you gain an additional one uh, one additional power token. A regiment counter is destroyed by Dark Shepherd if all the stands are removed. Yeah, okay. Um, 
That's why that's why you put it on him, and then you have the Archimandrite healing that unit. Yeah, that's that was the combo. Um, and then under treasures, he's got uh, the Reaping Crook. Increase the range of Dark Shepherd. Draw event to eighteen inches instead of I don't fucking know. Was it like twelve? Where the fuck it is? Yeah. Where is Dark Shepherd? I can't find it anymore. Is it a treasure? I don't think it was a treasure. Is it a Dark Blessing? Is it a retinue? I saw it here. What the hell? Uh, it's a special rule under Hero Deacon. 12 inches. Oh, it's just straight up he has it. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, there we go. So, yeah. That's kind of the combo with them. Um, that's kind of their abilities. I, I don't know. I see people grabbing Hero Deacons a lot just because you want to generate Dark Power Pool tier. He's kind of the go-to caster, and a lot of people want to take them in lists just to make sure your Dark Power Pool generator is going, and he's the guy. Um, Archimandrite is kind of if you want a, you want a big bad wizard in your list, but I think people are kind of moving towards the Zilliarch and Stratagos. Yeah. Or the Mounted Stratagos if you're taking a lot of Cataphractoi. Or you're kind of going down to the Fall in Divinity line and you're just taking your Deacon and like a Fall in Divinity and maybe like a Stratagos or a Zilliarch for some troops in that case. Yeah. So um, I think they have actually pretty good casting. I Their casting has a lot of interconnectivity and plays with itself in its own little bubble, but also kind of goes out and starts touching stuff where you're like, oh God, this mm-hmm. stuff can get like pretty scary, but it's like, does it get there? Does it get there in time to be relevant kind of thing? Like that's always my problem with Old Dominion is can you get to tier three fast enough? And if you're still relevant, because if you get to tier three at like turn seven, um, probably the game's over at that point. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What do you think of their spells and abilities off these two characters? They're fine. I mean, the like spellcasting in general, like anything that's that requires a bunch of setup is kind of not great. Like the, anything that spells that heal, spells that spells that do damage. Easy arguments to make there. Um, spells that like crescendo that help your chance out and potentially give you some acceleration also really good but other stuff i mean it's the same problem that uh that i had with the uh wadroon spells like something like blasphemous power or dark uh not dark immolation i mean even dark immolation is a little too zero of death one <laughs> put yeah, or of yeah. death on regiment and then your opponent has to activate the regiment in contact with that regiment it's like uh yeah, like the problem is if you dark if you activate dark immolation on something that doesn't already have aura of death, then I'm just like I'm going to ad- adapt to that and mm. just play around that to the best that I can with the deck that I have. Um, so it's not like I guess it's disruptive, but not even really to the degree that I think that you want it to be for the amount that you have to invest into that turn to make it work. Yeah, there's um, a bit of investment, like. I, I like I still think and just like Dweg has the best casting because it's very easy to do and they get a lot of it. And then they yeah. have bonuses that are associated with just casting and their casting is so good. Like fire and magma schools are really good offensive schools and um supposedly we're letting Earth down and Earth actually has some merit. Mm. But I gotta reread the comments for that one. <laughs> yeah. I also have to re listen to the episode so that I remember what the hell I even said because it's been like three weeks. <laughs> Um, Black yeah. Flame Coruscation feels a little, excuse me, I was yawning, um, that's not good podcast etiquette. Black Flame Coruscation, um, <clears throat> it feels a little weak compared to, um, Unholy Baptism. Um. Yeah, but it's not a character that's not supposed to be the Warlord or anything. Like, there's more offensive buffing for the Archimandrite compared to the Hero Deacon, while the Hero Deacon's more of a support guy who has just, like, a spell if he has nothing to support to do. Yeah. Yeah, but otherwise it's just all he's doing is making uh, tokens. He, he he makes the tokens. He's like the Swiss yeah. chef. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Their spellcasting is fine, and then it gets us into the regiments. Yeah, the Kiris and the Moris. Which one do you want to do first? 
Uh, the Kiras, uh, Kiras, Kiras, I don't know how that's pronounced. They're kind of funny because, uh, Terror or Insanity it was the bane of my existence playing against Old Dominion at 1.5, and now Kiras have gotten enough of a nerf that I don't care at all about it. Um, but it's range, ten, range of 10 inches, attunement 3. The effect is that you inflict 2 hits per success on target enemy regiment. That enemy rolls defense rolls using their lowest unmodified resolve characteristic instead of the defense characteristic. Wounds caused by the spell do not cause a morale test. Should the dark power pool reach tier 2, then any wounds caused by the spell cause 1 additional wound for each unmodified resolve roll of 6. This effect is cumulative when the dark power pool reaches tier 3. Should the Dark Power Pool reach Tier 3, then this spell also causes morale tests. Let me tell you, I've been hit by a Tier 3 Insanity. It fucking sucks. Yeah, that'd be rough. Yeah. It's just a lot of hits. But they are a light, and they're usually out. Like, you can usually kill them before they hit Tier 3. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not uh, too bad to um, deal with cures if you can get into them, so... Overall, you're not going to be taking too many tier three insanities, but in one point five, it was very brutal. Oh, it was and, super brutal! I think because the attunement on it was different, like it was a higher attunement yeah. or further range or something. I forget what it actually was, but it was brutal. Yeah, I think it's the attunement. But drain um, will is another interesting one, though. Mm -hmm. So that one's a uh, twelve inch range scaling three or attunement three scaling. If the spellcaster scores two to four successes, then reduce the target uh, enemy's regiment's defense characteristic by minus one until the end of the round. In addition, if the spellcaster scores four or more successes, then the target enemy regiment suffers one additional hit from any aura of death uh, special rules until the end of the round as well. So the first effect is all well and good. Um, there's definitely a use case for that. The second effect is just there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fine, but it's so specific that um, I don't. Uh, I I don't think anybody's running an aura death build that would take full advantage of that. No, I I do like how they have a uh, a defense reducer, like an armor break. What's not from cleave or anything. So yeah, it's like stuff that doesn't have cleave basically gets cleave one into that regiment. I do like that. It is a bit of setup for like having the cures go casting drain will. Um, we should probably talk about how the cures work as a spell casting regiment because they have the priest star rule. Um, so this regiment may perform a spell casting action using one stand, as if it were a character stand, during its activation. Its priest level is one per stand to a maximum of priest twelve. So with an MSU, you get your priest three. You have a memory of old to get priest plus one per stand. So I guess does it actually explain that more? Can perform something during the activation? So, does all the stands give you priest level plus one? Yeah, I think so. So if you if you have an MSU of three stands, you memories of old for priest plus one, and then you memories old again. Like if you you draw event them for priest plus one, so they go from three to six, and then you action them for priest plus one, you go from six to nine. And then you're, like, rolling nine dice of a drain will into someone or an insanity into someone. Oh, God, that'd be brutal. Thanks. Yeah, Jesus. Who likes that? No one likes that. Um, but you could you pick one of the stands to be the caster, so you can use, like, the corner guys and not just the middle one. It doesn't have to be the leader. Yeah. Um, so, I, I do like its spells. I There's a reason why people don't play this regiment much anymore. Um, I know people still play it, or is it the Moris that people don't play? <laughs> <laughs> I think Kiers kind of get some work done. Um, oh, the big thing... Oh, now I remember. Um, the big thing about the Kiris and the Moris that people don't like them is that they can't... These regiments can't be joined by a character stand, so you can't put, like, your Hero Deacon or Acromandrite into them to get them on the table turn one. And yeah. they're currently the only lights available to Old Dominion, so it's just kind of sucky in that way. Yeah, but they are. I I do like them. I think they are good. Yeah, I mean they're not the worst in the world. Um, I'm not looking at the stat lines or anything. Like those spells are at least they make the cures into to killers really decent harassment units. But I, I wonder if just people don't have expectations that they're of them to do more than they're designed to do. But I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I. 
I don't know. It's I would I would talk more to the community about that one. We're like, okay, what do you think about cures? Like, but that's more like a cures question, not about like a talk about magic. Like, yeah. If you get hit by a tier three insanity, you're probably gonna lose a bunch of guys. <laughs> is basically the the bottom line on that one. So if you can kill cures before they hit tier tier three, you're in a good spot. If you can't, be prepared to start losing stuff left and right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really all I can say. Um, Mori's they got two spells. They also have the priest plus one special rule. They also have the same thing of how they use spell actions, all that crap. What we talked about. Um, they have immolation. This regiment gains aura of death plus X, where X is the number of successful scored. Divided by two, rounded up. Any regiment affected by the spell has its aura of death X special rule limited to a maximum of five. I didn't realize it was divided by two, rounded up. So if you... <laughs> X is the number of success. So because they're, they're an MSU of three. So if you score three, you divide by two. So you're one and a half. You round up. So you just all the stands are aura of death two. Okay, well, it's not bad. But then you can like go higher if you just like priest it up a bunch. Like if you scored nine, divide by two, you get uh would you get five? Yeah, you get five per stand. So yeah, okay. It's not bad. Also like um why you are a death thing. Um yeah. their next rule is translocation. The regiment immediately performs a free additional eight inch march, ignoring all intervening regiments. Character stands and or terrain. The regiment must be placed in a legal position at the end of its movement to not overlap with any other regiment stands. This effect can be used even if the regiment is currently engaged with an enemy regiment. While performing this move, the regiment may move sideways or backwards without having to have its march characteristics. So these, you cast a spell to turn into ghosts and you just fuck off. Yeah. Um, I kind of like it actually. I kind of like it where yeah. you can run the Moris into someone, tie them up, and then just translocate the like past them and then have the space free for you to charge that regiment with another regiment kind of thing <laughs> like yeah just totally be a dick like if someone like march charges into your mores and it's like yeah i've tied up into the mores now i'm not going to get charged by the cataphractoid who are behind the mores and you're like the mores activate and translocate and just run behind them and you're like ah oh, fuck <laughs> <laughs> and then you get yeah. charged by cataphractoid and it's like oh god <laughs> i out of the Moris, I do like that rule. That one's that one seems really fun. Yeah, I, I would I, fuck around with that one a lot. I'd never taken a good look at that, but I like that quite a bit. Yeah, I don't think our local old Dominion player has used it on us before. That's why, but I yeah. think that's just like super funny. It's something you should always be aware of. Yeah. Um, they also have memories old for Cleave One. I guess you like. <sighs> could you? No, you can't get three actions. Yeah, so you could you could priest a bunch, translocate, move. And then next turn, you could Memories of Old for Cleave 1 and a bunch of Priests, and then you could just, like, charge someone in the back with Cleave 1 with your 6 attacks. Yeah, that sounds fun. Oh, they're Base Aura of Death 3. The Moris. Not bad. Okay, so now Immolation actually makes a lot of sense, because now you you baseline, you get plus 2 Aura of Death with an MSU of 3, if you rolled 3 successes. So then you'd be Aura of Death 5. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. I don't mind Immolation now, realizing they're Aura of Death 3 base. Yeah. And their terrifying one. Yeah, there's a lot going on with the Moris. <laughs> I think their problem is that they're evasion 2 and they're also a light, like, melee unit that's speed 6, so they usually get shot up before they can get anywhere. They Because yeah. they don't have loose formation. They only have fluid formation. I think the Curies have loose. Yeah, the Curies have loose, so... I don't know, maybe slapping loose formation on these guys would really help them get somewhere, but they have a lot going for them, surprisingly. Yeah, exactly. I like that. You got anything to say about these guys? Nothing that you didn't really touch on already. I think they have, I think that I mean, based on just the overall discussion that I see about Old Dominion, it seems like they're kind of slept on, but I might be wrong about that. But Translocation, I think, has a lot of uh, fun potential, so. Yeah, I would I would totally play them for the fun factor of just like, <laughs> just fucking, <laughs> booga, booga. it's like, oh my god. Yeah. Uh, you want to... Should we go to city states? Yeah, we got a character, and I think we got one regiment, and then two monsters. Oh, so two monsters. That's right. We got to talk about the monsters. Yeah, we should talk about the monsters because I saw. So while I was in Calgary, one of the guys played the um, monster improperly, 
and didn't read all of Herald of the Forge God. So we'll we'll talk about that one so that people don't miss out on dice. Mm. Okay, so character? Do you want to do yeah. this guy? Sure. Thank you. So we've got the mechanist. Um three spells. The first one, so they uh, are the robot guy. Uh aggression directive, ten inches. Two minute four scaling target friendly regiment with the automaton special rule adds plus one to its clash characteristic to a maximum of four until the end of the round. So that's to buff your clockwork hoplites. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, then we got clockwork parade, 12 inches, two minute three scaling target friendly regiment treats its total charge distance as its march value plus four inches until the end of the round. This effect supersedes the limit set by the Phalanx special rule. Um, okay, that's actually good. <laughs> you can also use that on, like, Hoplites and Phalanges and not just Clockwork people. Yeah, it seems weird that it's called Clockwork Parade, but doesn't have the automaton interaction, but that's none of my business. <laughs> um, then we've got one. Iron Stride at 8 inches. That's uh, a 2 and 2 scaling. Target friendly regiment ignores the effects of hindering terrain until the end of the round. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. And attunement too, it seems like it's a little hard to pull off. Yeah. But, it's you know, like, uh, for uh, what it is, it seems like it's difficult. Uh, aggression directive attunement uh, four with scaling actually seems pretty solid, giving them plus one clash. Because you're totally yeah. throwing this on a clockwork hopolites, because the automaton rule. Never lets you get inspired, and they're only Clash 2 base, so getting more Clash is a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah, and Clockwork Parade seems like it's insanely valuable for uh, city-states. Yeah. Well, because a lot of things have Phalanx, but are reduced to March um, plus 3, so getting a March plus 4 is that little extra right there. Yeah. But can you still take um, the Get Naked um, artifact with Clockwork Hopolites? Where is it? Yeah, inscriptions of lighter alloys. Until end around the infantry regiment, the character stands currently attached and removes one defense characteristic to a middle one. Lose the phalanx and shield special rule adds plus three to its march characteristic until end of round. Oh shit. Um. So and then clockwork parade is march plus four. So you could yeah, lighter yeah. out. So you could take a mechanist with a unit of clockwork hoplites. Lighter alloys. The clockwork hoplites are march five. So now they go to march eight. Yeah, they go to march eight. Then they charge plus four. So they go to 12. That's not bad. That's pretty good. A consistent March 12. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah, and then they stab somebody in the face. They will do that almost certainly. Yeah, he's... Yeah. I know he's out, but he's literally waiting for the clockwork hopolite so that his whole kit works. Yeah. Mmm... I'm looking at the modifications. A Cocker Hop Hoplite Regiment gets a double time draw event. Um, Resonation Receptors. When a friendly Promethean successfully casts a spell, the regiment this character stands currently attached receives the benefits of the spell regardless of range. Okay. Um, there's an Aura of Death one. There's not a ton of magic stuff in the City State's uh, like bonuses. Like The only one I can find is... Inscriptions of balance. When an enemy spellcaster uses a regiment as a target of a spellcasting action, the regiment counts as three cents larger for the purposes of scaling. So, Surreal Dominion, all your attack spells are based off scaling. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're, they're more like buffy than they are offensive power, and their buffs are kind of self contained where you kind of don't really go past that. Yeah. Um,. I want to, well, no. Do you, do you want to talk about the Sacred Band, and I'll talk about um, the Hepestian? Sure. Because <laughs> I know you're, um, you're a huge fan. Do you want me to do the Hepestian first so you can get ready for the Sacred Band? <laughs> it's up to you. I don't mind jumping right into it. No, I'll do the Hepestian first. Okay, so, uh, big thing about the Hepestian and the, um, what is it? What the hell is it called? The Promethean is that they have the Herald of the Forge God special rule, and um, at the end of, so, at the end of this regiment's activation and the beginning of the deactivation regiment step. So once you're done um, charging and clashing and all that crap, you get a you get to make a you now when you're done its activation, you get to make a free 
spell casting action if you were a character. Furthermore, spells cast by this regimen require a minimum of four successes rather than the usual two. This regimen may not attempt to cast the same spell more than once during its activation. I will get on to that clause. Finally, this regimen adds plus X dice to any spell casting action it performs during where X is the number of successful hits caused to an enemy regiment during its activation. So, because it's a priest too, um, you can cast a spell with the Hepestian during your turn. So you could charge someone, do a bunch of impact attacks, because you just need hits. All you're looking for is hits. And then you could, let's say, maybe, let's say you hit with all five of your impact attacks and your opponent saves them all. So now you're priest two plus the five, so you're priest seven. Now you can cast a spell as your second action, so you can do Crucible of Fire, what is give yourself aura death seven for the turn, or Trident Strike, what is infect one hit per success on target enemy regiment, range six. Um, so you could cast, let's say you could cast Aura of Death on yourself. And you're like, okay, cool. Then you could trigger the Herald of the Forge God. So you're a priest two, you've already counted your hits, so you're seven still. And then you could cast Trident Strike, because you've now ended your turn. But what a lot of players do is that they charge, do their impact attacks, then maybe they get like two hits. So they put those two successful hits off to the side. Then they roll their Clash. Maybe they hit eight out of the ten times. So they take those eight dice, put them to the side. So your impact is caused two, your attacks caused eight, you have ten dice, plus your Priest two is twelve. You now have twelve spell casting dice that you can you use either on Crucible of Fire for Aura of Death seven, what's attunement four. Or Trident Strike was a two and four, and you can roll those twelve dice to get one hit per success on an enemy regiment within six inches. So the Hepestian can totally go in, charge, clash, kill a regiment, and if there's six inches someone else away, just try and strike them for a bunch of damage. You hate to see it. Oh, it's funny when it happens. Um, <laughs> the other thing you can do is let's say you whiff a ton of your attacks. Let's say you only get one impact and four clashes, and now you only have five dice plus your two is seven, and you're kind of like. And I'm not going to really do much on Trident Strike. Like, I've I've had an opponent actually only do, like, three impact attacks. Like, he just March Charged me. And I was like, oh, oh I'm going to, like, uh, this unit hasn't activated yet. And then he, on the five dice, cast Crucible Fire, and I took Aura of Death 7 and, like, lost one of my um, Sealed Temple. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so there there <laughs> is cases for both of them. If you're kind of, like, I find it with the Hephaestion, if you're being offensive, you're just going to be trying striking more just because you're going to get that damage out there and reduce damage into you because you're killing stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you're, like, knowing someone's going to be engaged with you and then activating, or death is also, like, not bad. So, he's a, he's a pretty good monster. He's good for what he's doing, yeah. but I just wanted to bring that attention. Like, Herald of Forge God, it's four successes instead of two, and you want to count up all your hits as he's going through till the end of his activation to find out how many spell casting you dice for that free spell casting action at the end of his activation. Those yep. are the big things I want to bring up about him. And that also ties over to the Promethean because he works the exact same way. Okay, do Sacred Band and I'll end on the Promethean. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, the Promethean, um, I'll talk about him. He's kind of sad. Poor guy. So the Sacred Band, my favorite unit of the um, city-states. Uh, so they've got two spells. Uh, oh, they're both pretty straightforward. So there's Othismos, uh, which is range of self, attunement three. This regiment loses the blessed special rule. Instead, it re-rolls failed defense rolls and morale tests until the end of the round, and the regiment's command stand counts as three stands for the purposes of seizing objective zones. Um, so you lose Blast to get a, a better defensive Blast. Yeah, it's fun and, fucking everything. Yeah, and then you can, um, contest zones better. So, why wouldn't you? Great spell. Pretty straightforward. Um, and then we've got Molon Labe, I guess? Molon Lab? Who knows? It's Molon, uh, Molon Rouge. Yeah, <laughs> Moulay, Moulay Labe. Yeah. Uh, so range self, attunement two, for each success, target regiment, heals one wound. Um, the thing about healing spells is they're generally what they say on the tin type spells, and this one is no different. So it's just, uh, if you need healing, you got it. Um, it's a little bit hard to pull with uh, attunement two, but uh, still, you'll get a couple off. They're also just priest four. You just 
I feel like Sacred Band is totally one of those regiments where you just shove onto a zone, get into a fight with somebody, and then you just keep casting, oh, what was it, Othemos, and then keep attacking, and just like, well, I'm going to keep re-rolling all defense and resolve so you could, it's like a fucking ass to kill me. <laughs> yeah. And then once you kill something and you're sitting on the zone, you just like, Cast the uh, Molong Rouge spell to heal up until the next guy comes and fights you. That's it. Yeah, like, pretty much. Like four dice, a two and three on Othinus. You eh, two successes. You're probably getting it off. Sometimes it might be tough. I've I know for sure I've failed that roll before, but um, and then the Healy spell. It's uh, two and two. That fucking sucks. <laughs> it's rough, but <laughs> that really you know, sucks. Yeah, it's better than no healing spell. Um, the seer officer gives you plus one priest level, so you go to five, plus one resolve, so you go to four, and you gain indomitable, so you just pass one resolve, so that's, like, actually probably taking the officer with the sacred band is probably a good bet if you're using them as an anvil. Yeah. This is totally just an anvil objective holder regiment. I like them. Yeah, they're just, um... Just some, they're just some good guys. Just really friendly guys. Yeah, they're just the... I don't know. <laughs> I want to say it, but I also want to. They're the gay Valkyries. Like. The gay... <laughs> well, yeah, there's all these ladies over there. Now there's going to be a bunch of dudes over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, They're really the showing off gender you... roles here. Yeah. If you're... the one, one thing I like consistently in the Conquest universe is that if you're part of a kind of gay-coded regiment, you'll get the blessed special rule. Yeah, you are truly blessed. Yeah. Once, once you, so, <laughs> Jeez, no, yeah, I, I like. I mean, big ups to PB for being progressive in that regard. Being very progressive. <laughs> Let's get on them. I, I would like to see when, the, like, what this unit looks like uh, when they come out. I'm, I'm really interested in them, and I kind of like them a lot. I have no idea if they do well in city states and their whole game plan, but just on paper, I like it. But I have no yeah. idea how it's going to actually look on the table. Um, lastly, we have the Promethean. He has the Herald of the Forge God rule. We've already went over that. He's also a priest too. Um, he is the buffing giant. So after he smacks, a, smacks someone up the head, he has Tempered Resolve. All friendly regiments with an aid of this regiment may re-roll defense rolls and morale test rolls of six until end of round. And his other one is Clenched Blades. For a team at four, all friendly regiments within eight inches of this regiment may reroll hit rolls of six and add plus one to the class characteristic to a maximum of four until the end of round. Nice buffs, pretty solid. Um, his problem is, is that he wants to go first, um, smack a bitch, get one of these spells off, and then have everyone else go and benefit from the spell. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that he is a big boy, he is a size three giant. And he usually gets shot in the face and dies. <laughs> or he gets charged. Or he doesn't do enough offensively to justify what he's doing because they're just, like, buffs. And you kind of have to play him a little weirdly. Like, you gotta have him go do his thing, hope he lives, get somebody who can actually take a hit in front. Like, he doesn't want a second wave because you want your buffs out first. He doesn't want a first wave because he'll just eat it and die like he's in a really weird spot as a support piece yeah it's um so it was the other giant uh he was just all offensive previously but um did this happen too but i just want to it, it just made me your critiques of the unit made me think about what happened in one of my recent games that i enjoyed a lot so i want to talk about it but okay. uh, i was playing a city states player and they threw their giant into uh like a rear charge into my um Chosen a conquest, which would have normally been a perfectly sensible move, except that the Chosen a conquest had just enough wounds on them to tie up that giant long enough um, for my dinosaur, which was just coming in, my apex predator, to the field <laughs> um, to get the charge in. And I guess my city state's opponent was not thinking about fiend hunter but the thing that i find is that with fiend hunter having units is people with fiends only make that mistake once <laughs> so um hopefully it was a teaching moment uh if nothing else but it does feel really good when somebody leaves their monster out in the open and you can throw your dinosaur into it and 
pretty much do a one activation kill um, with all those rerolls. Just a big chomper. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 good. It feels nice. But anyway, a uh, huge digression. But yeah, the support giant seems like it's in a weird place right now. It probably needs some adjustment before it's really the one to take. Yeah, I I wouldn't even mind if they had Herald of the Forge God on both, but then just gave the support giant more, like, make him like a priest two or four or five, just so he can just cast his spells himself and doesn't have to worry about being up there and potentially dying. <laughs> For yeah. for the the spell cause, but it's easier if he's getting the work done, but he can still kind of do it. Yeah, I don't know this guy. Like he, that, that's what I've seen, and like people are kind of just like, oh, just take the Hepestian. <laughs> he'll just he'll he will stab someone to death because he's like cleave three. Like you're just asking for yeah. someone to get eaten by that guy. Yeah, he's cleave think... three, terrifying two compared to the Prometheans cleave two, terrifying one. Everything else is the same. Yeah, everything the else problem, is the same. Yeah. The problem with a lot of these support spells right now is just the way that timing works. Oh, yeah. And I don't have a solution. Like, I can't intuitively think of a solution to that, so I don't really know what to say about that. But, like, there's got to be a way to make it um, so that you can cast spells without sacrificing priority and tempo. Yeah, because that's kind of like the so, big hit. Like, there's a bit of me who wants to say, like, oh, some spells are until end of round. Some spells are until the regiment activates again. And it's like, how would you decide which ones are which? How do you decide if it's too powerful or not? Would some spells need to be adjusted to compensate yeah. for if they are until uh, the regiment activates again? Because then basically you're spamming the same spell over and over again. And we have the um, 1.5, like, Call of Fog healing mage going on. And it's like, no, fuck that shit. Mm. So. Yeah. Um that's that's it for magic and magic in the different factions. What what do you have any overall thoughts about magic? It's um it's part of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Just it exists. Yeah, it's um Yeah, water is wet. What else are you going to tell me? <laughs> it's a like it's hard to balance in um it, it's the same problem that ranged has in a sense, um, but more so in that it's hard to balance in a game that's about largely about infantry fighting, um, mm -hmm. or people just like who don't position easily getting into fights. Um, so it is what it is. I'll always find it funny that they were like, "Oh, two point is going to have a the big magic rework. Nothing is ever going to be the same again." Uh, if you thought you knew magic, well, you didn't know anything, and then it was just like, well, now you need two successes to cast the spell. Yeah, it's just like, woo. And so that was always pretty funny to me. Um, the, the utility thing is the main problem with it. Um, I think that with magic in its current form, even if this isn't thematically what PB had in mind, they probably need to give, um, every faction some kind of a direct damage spell, and then differentiate them through efficiency because mm -hmm. um, I think that there is a gap when like um, the problem is, like it's not great when the scion is bringing turning off your draw events to a magical gunfight <laughs> yeah <laughs> just straight up <laughs> yep um, you're on that one so I feel like, and I, I don't know what the solution is there to make it thematic or whatever the case is, so again, I'm useless, I'm just complaining and, and uh, bringing up problems with no solutions, but that's what I do. Well, well it's just, like, I, I keep saying it, like, it's easy to critique, it's hard to fix, like, we kind of bring it up of, like, listener, this is magic, this is what's going on in magic, we're talking about kind of, like, here's some combos, here's some things you need to be aware of in all the different factions, here's how magic works, here's, like, rules you gotta understand, here's, like, corner cases and edges, this is what we've learned of magic, so, like, if you're listening to this and you're, like, don't play magic, or, like, your opponents don't really play magic, it's kind of tough, like, when I, when I first started, um, playing Conquest, I didn't grab, like, a chapter mage for quite a while, and it got to the point where I'm like, I have no idea how magic works. I like, I have a Dwight player throwing fireballs at me, and I have no idea how this works. So I started playing the chapter mage so I could figure out how magic works. And then as I played it more and understood it more, it's like, 
what were the things I could do to defend myself and handle magic? And a lot of the time, a lot of magic isn't that great unless it's doing offensive work. Like, I find nine times out of ten. There's a couple cases yeah. where you want to do a defensive buff or, like, um, cast a support spell because you can get away with it due to how the how that turn is playing out. But a lot of the times you're kind of just, like, kill spell go. Because yeah. you're just going to get more work out of it um, turn after turn because it's like, well, if I'm in range to kill, I'm in range to kill. Yeah. In Conquest, I, I definitely find that, like, the best defense is just killing the thing first. So, <laughs> see my enemies driven before me and the limitations of the <laughs> weem. And... <laughs> yeah. So, anything that, like, kills stuff is, like, it's better to just kill something a little faster than it is to um, sacrifice, like, tempo or priority or both to die a little bit slower. Yeah. Um, do you, do you like magic? Like how the actual magic system itself works? Like there's the attainment value and the wizard level, and then how you roll and everything. It's fine. Yeah. It's I, like it's not. I can't really think of a way to make it better. Like it's the only thing that I would maybe change about the system in general is to have interference make opposing spellcasting a little more interactive. Um, Because right now I don't think it's very impactful. We didn't even bring it up over the course of this uh, discussion, I don't think, except for maybe very briefly in the last episode. Um, It's generally like you're not going to plan around interfering with spells. You'll grab that five point plus priest level to just in case if you have five points kicking around sometimes. Everybody's done it. I've done it too. You know, you don't have to be too proud to admit that. (laughs) We're all friends here. Um, for the most part. (laughs) Um, Good enough. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but, uh, like, so the the story that I always go to is I was trying to charge a Dweg home unit with my Warbred, and they were getting into range for the charge, and then my opponent um, dismayed them, and then did his own charge, and the break turned into a shatter. And that was rough. Um, But if I at least could have, like, you know, even if I could have just rolled for a six and canceled that spell or something with the benefit of interference, even if that wouldn't have applied in that particular situation, but just, like, maybe if there was a way to make it more of an opposed thing rather than just, like, I'm going to make your number slightly worse, you know, so that it feels like you're doing, like, a like wizard shit to each other type thing. Yeah. But I don't really know, because people find a way to be pissed off about that, too, so... Well, here's the thing I found about interference. If there's a dedicated spellcaster, like a dwag wizard, they're getting the spell off. You're not changing anything. But if there's, like, a little guy spellcaster, like, um, ma- like the hero deacon or the me- the mechanist or, like, a arcane one chapter mage, they have actually a chance of not getting the spell off. Like, interference yeah. mostly affects the people who have a harder time of getting spells off even more, while I find stuff that it's, like... I am an Arcane 3 focused um Dwight Wizard. So I'm I'm Wizard 7. I'm only going to I'm going to get an auto success and I'm going to re-roll two of these dice. It's like, yeah, you're probably getting the spell off, dude. You don't need to worry. <laughs> and, and you know, that's almost a sort of a recurring design thing that I'm seeing in Conquest um is that whether it's cleave, whether it's spellcasting, whether it's um whatever like all of these mechanics work better on stuff that's already weak in the stat that it attacks versus something that's strong in that attack so i find that this game mechanically like favors bullying which i think is kind of funny aggression not just aggression but like you want to you really want to punch down almost as much as possible because that's why not the most return on i don't want to right? lose <laughs> If if I kill all your friends, then your big strong thing is all alone, and I could probably kill them. You can just do whatever you want to things that can't fight back. But, uh, <laughs> that was dark. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's that's why I love like even though it seems like it's a like a a bad trade, 
It sort of because it's uh, not a trade because I, I when I do it right I don't lose anything but like throwing like running an apex predator up the back line to eat men at arms like she loves it she devours them they they don't stand a chance against her particular suite of special rules but like apex predator is not going to win a stand up fight against something that's statted similar to her so it's like she yeah. wants to bully or anything bigger than her like. Oh. Like, uh, is it bigger? Bigger military diplomacy. <laughs> it's kind of like I, I've I've watched like, um, like old battle histories and like how how battles went or like how like world history went and it was like bigger armor diplomacy or yeah big bigger arm army diplomacy won this and so like now Henry the Bold moved his forces this way and he used bigger army diplomacy to like push his way north into Scotland and it's like. Yeah, okay, that that makes sense. Like just my numbers are bigger than you. Die. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. Uh... And, but it's also like part of the game of like matchups and counter like um deploying and counter deploying. Like I don't want to put like if I don't need to put my weaker stuff against your harder stuff and I can take my harder stuff and put it against your weaker stuff, like of course I'm gonna do that because it's just free kills. Limits you and what you can do, and then I can kinda like move around and swarm you later. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the game... I don't know, maybe this is a stupid thing to say. I'm sure I'll hear about it in the... Well, no, people are very polite for some reason, but <laughs> I should hear about it in the comments. Um, You're just like, people are mean to me. It's like, man, I don't think anyone's ever been mean to you on, on the Conquest, like, anywhere on the Discord or any any Conquest-related space so far that I know of. No, nobody ever has, but I'm dramatic. I know. Um, so. it's, why, it's why you're around. <laughs> yeah. It's true. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Now I've completely forgotten the point that I was going to make, so that's fun. Um, let's see if it comes back here now. No, it's gone. Um, <laughs> if it comes back to me, I'll bring it up. Um, No, it's just, it's gone forever. It's gone? Yeah, it's gone. So, I guess we'll just move forward. Okay. Do you want to <laughs> do you want to do listener questions? Yeah, yeah, let's knock off some listener questions. Alright, you ready for this? Hit me. First question. What's your least favorite regiment to fight and why? Hmm. Well, do you want to give your answer first while I think of mine? Okay, sure. My answer is Fireforge with a Dweg caster in it. Because the Fireforge are defense 3 plus 1 from the shield to go into defense 4. The resolve 4. And the either it's a Magma or a Fire Wizard is being a dick. And the Fireforge are like Barrage 4 with Armor Piercing 2. And they're a huge asshole to deal with. Um, they are Volley 2, but you can always just take aim and shoot at somebody. And they're just this really amazing bunker for the Dweg Wizard, and I hate it. And I hate dealing with it because it takes more resources to get there, and um, I usually lose a lot trying to get to the damn thing and like kill it off before it becomes a serious problem. But if the Dweg player castles properly, it is a huge pain in the ass to even get to, and then if I even get to it, they use the shit tickets to deny all my attack rolls, and then I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's mine. How about you? Um, I'm going to be annoying and give general answers. Um, so it's, um, probably my least favorite, uh, enemies or regiments to fight are ones that have high defense and then also can get tenacious or high resolve and can get indomitable. Um, That's fair. That, that just pisses me right off. Just, um, <laughs> I get one damage through and they're like, nope. And you're like, God yeah. damn it. Yeah, it's um it's to the point where and I've been the beneficiary of these builds as well many a time, but like I feel like Indomitable should be something that really only goes to low resolve units. Um I also think that the resolve modifiers maybe we is something that needs to be looked at from a general design standpoint, which is probably not gonna win me any friends to say, but that's my honest opinion. I think it's too many... Like, it's too... Right now, it's too easy 
to get to just like like it's the defense five problem all over again. Yeah, but at least when it's resolve five, you know damage is going through on the defense to get hits in to reduce that resolve due to scaling. Yeah. And already damage is going into the regiment while like having just high defense base, you're just like, well now now you're not even getting to the resolve step. Yeah. No, that's fair. It's um I like I'm probably a little too mad about it, but I I don't know. I think there's maybe some tweaking of the numbers that could happen to make it feel a little bit better on both sides. But either way, I do think indomitable and tenacious should be something that helps normalize or reduce, I guess, unnormalize output for um, low stat units rather than something that just makes uh, resilient units even more resilient. That's that's my that's the main thrust of my point and what I want people to focus on, even though they're gonna go for the second thing and invent a guy to get angry at. <laughs> well, it's you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ready for the next question? Yes. Mm, what's better in your mind? Short stack goblin gremlins or big Amazonian hard orc mommies? <laughs> this is specifically for you. Yeah, no, my answer um, is why not both? Why not both? Um, but I mean, they this it's hard to choose because they both have um, not just uh, their own advantages, but really distinct and um, you know, it's really two different worlds. So really, it just like it's just I I can't find an answer that isn't some variation of the more the merrier when it comes to those two specific. Um, group said myself um, and in fact you know let's go with multiples um, <laughs> you're just making, a, each. just making a green harem yeah <laughs> Jesus yeah sometimes a relationship is uh, me and five orc mommies and four goblin short stacks and that's and that's beautiful really you know that we live in such a rich tapestry of the world what about you? <laughs> I'm it's not fair that I'm the only one who has to well, answer. Well, it's specifically this directed to you. <laughs> <laughs> if, so if I had to pick, I would um I I would be down to to date um one one or the other. I'd be down so I'd be down for both. I would just mm. I wouldn't like Group them all together into my harem because I have, I am too busy for that. I can't. I don't have time to run a harem. I'm not an anime protagonist here, so I would date one or the other, and it'd basically come down to whoever I kind of met first and got along with first. That's fair. Yeah. Um, actually, now that you mention it, not only would I have a harem, but Jesus I would uh, two. I would two time them with another harem. <laughs> wait, 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 wait! You would have the harem of five Amazonian hard orc mommies and four. Short stack goblin gremlins, and then you would two time them with another harem of five. Yeah, Amazon I don't know what the composition of that one would be. It's you, <laughs> just whatever you imagine is fine. Oh, yeah. the, the, the lizard yeah. people would show up again. The scales, <laughs> the scales. You'd have like this will be as weird as you <laughs> want it to get on, <laughs> on air. So yeah, sure. We uh, throw them on the pile. I have never been to a furry convention. I want that stated. I never planned to be at a furry convention. I also want that stated. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But this is where that's going, and I don't know if I'm gonna be. I'm gonna survive. Someone, I'm not. Some, I'm I calling just for want help. To I don't want to die from that I'm not making any such denials. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! <laughs> of course, you would go to the fucking furry convention. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. Sorry. I just thought the idea of um, of cheating on a multi-person polycule with another multi-person polycule is very funny. <laughs> I'm brain poisoned, but <laughs> um, yeah. So that's a that's an in depth uh, answer to the question that nobody wanted. Nobody to have. wanted, except for <laughs> except for fucking Orc Karl Marx. <laughs> Figure out who that was. Oh my Orc god! Karl, wow. I mean, technically, me. But <laughs> are you are you a communist? Are you an Orc communist? That I'm not going to cop to, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when it comes to the distribution of, um, I guess, hot orc and goblin women, then yes, I, um, 
I'm very much a socialist in that respect. <laughs> I believe in orc supremacy. I believe, sorry, I believe in short sack goblin gremlin supremacy. <laughs> I really do. Oh my god. <laughs> The last I'm I'm fanning myself at my desk right now. Oh, what's going to Oh god. Wait until the over. podcast is over, please. You can do whatever you we want. Should probably get into Yeah. You get into a more boring question here. Okay. <laughs> okay, next question. What is your favorite part of the narrative lore of conquest? To both of us this time, not just you, but to <laughs> both of us. Um, well, do you want to answer first? Because I actually have a pretty detailed answer for this. So. Oh, okay. Mine is, um, the Steel Legion lore and how the Emperor died on the battle. For, I think it was for the last, I don't believe it was the last Argument Kings. I feel the last Argument Kings happened after the Emperor died because it was like his son or something had to go deal with the Spires and then realize how fucked he was. So maybe it was that one. But anyway, the last, uh, Hundred Kingdoms Emperor died. And they had to disband all the legions, and the bodyguard legion, what was the adamantine legion, threw down all their swords, and uh, fucked off. And the steel legion was like, yo dog, we're not into that, we're not into disbanding. And so they walked over and took up all the swords, and were like, we're just gonna keep killing. And uh, no one could tell them no, and to stop, and to stop doing that, because everyone was too afraid of dealing with them. So uh, they stuck around. Fair. <laughs> That's my favorite lore. <laughs> That's fair. How about you? Um, so, I guess it's not a specific piece of lore, but the thing that really I like about, um, Conquest as a setting is that foundationally every, um, every faction is sort of defined by its trauma, um, Ooh, and cool. every, uh, faction sort of had this one sort of catalyzing moment, whether it was, like, the collapse of the Empire, um, and the, what everyone had to go through to get away from the the fall of the old dominion sort of defining the hundred kingdoms um or the trauma of closing the door behind everybody who wasn't you from the spires <laughs> and uh leaving them to whatever fate was so bad that everybody had to leave um over it um the dweg home and their uh the process of going through it, it's i think it's called Ducoro. Um, the like the ritual process of tunneling down to to destruction and then the the recreation of that and um you know just the the extended protracted period of slavery that uh, caused them to make <laughs> that deal as well of course um can't be understated um the uh sorry i'm just running through them just to to sort of define what i mean by this for the listener but uh, the wadroon um being the sacrificial sort of weapon um because the spire didn't want to get just shit canned by <laughs> angry dweg home um and then miraculously surviving in spite of that um the old dominion you know their god tried to use try to kill them all <laughs> them as fuel to become an even bigger god <laughs> um and now they've just got the um it's fucked up god well now they've just got that like echo of the uh, the anger of the god itself and the the uh, rage at not doing it um that sort of defines how they act as as entities in the wake of that so that as well as you know sort of an expression of trauma to me um i can't really think of what the city states is off the top of my head but i'm sure uh, somebody who's more well versed in the law uh, is able to find that, that would you like me to tell you well. yeah hit me okay so basically during the fall there was um two so city states weren't created yet there was um like a wizard man who was part of the old dominion or the dominion at the time and a guy who was like really good at logistics and supplies and they basically teamed up and were like wow, we can see the collapse happening. Like, it's there's a writing on the walls, and they kind of got, like, an early idea that this is totally happening, so they basically went in and took everyone who was smart and useful to society and all these and everyone and just made um, a bunch of cities out on the... I wouldn't say on the border, but, like, out into the wilderness. Like, they made a bunch of colonies. They made about, I think, like, 12 of them. And mm. um, one of the big things the guy figured out was that... Um, 
belief is power, power is energy, and energy is like belief. Like there's this triangle that like is a self, um, is like a positive feedback loop of, of energy. So basically, mm-hmm. what he set up was that there was um, each city has a god. The people believe in that god. That god is then trapped, and all the power that's generated from that god is then funneled into the creations of the city to power the city. And so, um, the dude did that, had one, and then he made, like, clones of himself, basically, that were the council, that were there to rule and design the city and not have corruption, except as he was doing all this, he realized that he was running out of time, and so near the end, like, getting closer and closer to collapse, he was less, like, he was more open to the fact that he was just, like, stealing people and resources and... Um, knowledge and just like funneling it off to these cities and then the collapse happened and he took everything he could and then he established the city states and then the big thing with the city states is that only one of these cities actually works out the way he designed where the council keeps everything under control there's no corruption the people believe in the god the god generates the power for the people to to have energy for the city um in some of the cities the people rose up against the council when they figured out that there was a god that in like underneath the city powering everything and like killed the council and then the god like exploded out and killed everybody <laughs> or like took over um there was some that got like super religious and figured out like the council was containing a god and killed the council and like worshiped the god um then there's one where the council is basically like super corrupt and is just like murdering people left and right to keep their corruption under like not under control but to keep their power of corruption so it's all like basically only one of them actually works properly and all the other ones are various degrees of getting fucked over by their system well that's classic yeah (laughs) they're great (laughs) um one another question yeah um yeah we should do one more it's unfortunately it's looking a little late so we might have to start looking at wrapping it up but I'm sure we can knock off one or two more questions okay maybe we'll maybe we'll do these things like at the start of next episode finish them off um what is your favorite color and why is it purple <laughs> do you know who, um, do you know who said this one no surprisingly oh okay well i will not say hmm. the very particular well, person who said know. this one interesting I'm gonna go find it. Oh, I have it's that like all the way to the top. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's not purple. I mean, purple's up there. Purple's a good color. But, purple is a good um, color. I like um, teal and turquoise probably the best, and red orange. I only like colors that are two colors. Because mm. it's it's <laughs> it's the future. Like who has time for one color? So if it's blue and green, I'm into it. If it's blue and purple, I'm into it. If it's red and orange, I'm into it. If it's anything else, I don't have time. So, do you know the capes on my household nights? Um, not off the top of my head, no. Okay, so my my favorite color is a is a dark green, like a dark foresty green. Mm-hmm. And so I use that as like a clothing material on all my guys. Nice. So, like, I think um. Steel Legion have a little bit of on maybe the Steel Legion don't. I don't think the Steel Legion do, but any of the anything from like the the Men at Arms, the Merc Crossbows, the Household Knights, they all have like this dark green cloth color on them that I use, and mm-hmm. it's just like it's, I like I like dark green, I like forest green, I like pine trees. Yeah, mm-hmm. I um you know I saw um Nike Air Max nineties um in uh, the infrared colorway when I was a young child. And it made such an impression on me that that's just the color that I gravitate towards in any scenario now, um, for any reason. So it's it, it's to the point where I it's something I have to be conscious of because if I'm just choosing colors I like when I paint things, it'll always be like teal and red orange. It's not a bad combo, and then you know they're yours. You can be like, I can find them. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a monotony that I like, but I also hate to be too monotonous about things. So. <laughs> um, so, uh, we'll just finish up listener questions next episode. Yeah. I mean, we can even try and get more over time and, and throw, you know, 
We've done like two hours. How how about we try not killing ourselves this time? Oh no, I don't mean tonight. I just mean like over the course of the next few episodes, just pepper in a few reader questions every time. We could do that. That actually, that's smart. Yeah, more content. Yeah, we gotta milk it. Obviously. Yeah. (laughs) I should delete the ones we've done so I keep track and not forget. (laughs) But I won't. Yeah, I guess we need a spreadsheet or something. No, fuck that shit. That sounds like work. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, you know what? Let's just spread them at the end. Screw it. Let's do a couple until we're all done. And if people uh-huh. if people want to add listener questions, we have a listener question channel on the Bonk Table Discord in the description below if you want to join that. And we got well, you're already on podcast, so you know about that one. But we do have a YouTube channel. You can go see that at YouTube Bonk Table. Yeah, it's just called Bonk Table. Um, we got a bunch of bow reports. Um, there's some lore readings there, and yeah, that's about it. What else? What else do we have to plug? Um, that's it for now. Um, I think overall, um, I guess we'll see what comes in the new year. Um, I want more Wadrun units. So, well, it's Sealed Temple in January, so I'm excited for that. I'm not. I am. I'm getting two boxes right off the bat. Yeah. It's kind of what you gotta, uh, like, not to sound like a shill for this game or anything, but I feel like any time a unit is good enough to be worth buying, you probably just gotta buy two boxes right off the hop or intend it. Just gotta accept your two-box minimum buy-in. Yeah, and you might even be a three-boxer, like Thunder Riders. So, like, uh, Chosen of Conquest are a two-box. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thunder Riders, that's a three-boxer. <laughs> that's a, this is three boxes, man. That's a three box deal right there. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us. <laughs> I hope everyone had a had a great time uh, listening to our wrap up of magic, um, chat about Calgary, and some of the listener questions. Uh, I guess we'll do more of them. Um, thank you for listening. I hope people enjoy this. Um, I don't know. Spread tell tell your friends. Tell, tell your friend, you know, word of mouth. Yep. Yeah. Tell your friends who don't play Conquest. Yeah, especially like, your friends who don't play Conquest. This, this sure, it's about a war game, but mostly they talk about not that war game. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, I'll see about... I'll, I might go through our uh, pre-ramble and see if there's anything interesting in there to throw in. Oh my god. Well, the last time uh, you uh, did that, you, you left in a bunch of stuff where I was like, well, I didn't know that was going in the podcast. <laughs> you should listen to our podcast and then like filter it then. If you want, I can send it to you early. No, it's fine. I, I like how, that uh, there are things that I'm not necessarily... Like, I love novelty, so <laughs> anytime there's an avenue where things that I'm not necessarily expecting are going to start happening, like I'm generally not going to argue um one of one of the things i got for feedback is that people like us for how um like realistic we are <laughs> just like two people chatting about dumb shit that's fair yeah i mean the that, fact that, that was that a we really don't, nice comment actually that we don't prepare and don't rehearse i guess is really <laughs> paying off what the fuck is a script oh one guy was yeah. like um, yeah, you can really check out Bog Table and their bow reports. They have some great special effects, and I'm like, what the fuck is a special effect? <laughs> <laughs> I show. I'm gonna when I finally make a battle report, though. Like, I'm gonna throw in as many like goofy little uh, digital video effects as I can now because of that. You should you should go get like stock explosions and just like whenever a regiment dies, just go like it's like and it's dead. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Don't. Tempt me with a good time. Oh, now now I'm waiting to see it. Because I have to put it up on the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. I, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get too much into it until I actually do it. But uh, the last couple of games I've been playing have, have really been feeling like there's almost... Co- and I'm over my uh, fear of not getting all the facts right. I, in fact, I've embraced it. So now that I've sort of leaned into the idea that it's like, I'm just going to get a bunch of stuff wrong when I talk about this. I, <laughs> it makes me much more comfortable. I um, now, now that I have had clarification that no one was saying uh, Anathan... Oh, God, I'm going to fuck it up again. Anathan... T? Athanatoi? Athanatoi? No, it's like... It's, the O-I ends up as like an E sound. Athanatoi... I think it's a fanity. 
Um, when Leo like told me, or Leandros told me like how Athenity are actually said, I was kind of like, "Aha! Everyone's been fucking it up. <laughs> no one <laughs> can, no one can tell me I suck at words." <laughs> I, I um, words. I don't know. I like to me, an inside joke can be just me. So sometimes pronouncing stuff wrong is like extremely hilarious to me. But it gets I get so committed to the bit that I just look stupid to everyone, and that probably happens a lot in this game. Oh, I'm just terrible at sp like saying stuff because I I read everything uh, photonically. So mm -hmm. if it doesn't sound the way it's read, then I'm like completely fucked. That's fair. There's been a couple words, like, I've had to, like, train my, my head to be, like, that's not how you say it. it like, uh, resume? Whenever I see the word resume, I always want to say resume. Yeah. Or resum well, or something. But it's, it's like, it's resume. It's like, that doesn't fucking sound like that. <laughs> yeah. English language is, uh, it's, it's an inbred dog. I mean, what are you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor puppy. Um, I mean, I'm not wrong. Like, it's really, it's messed up. Like, it's fine. It's good enough. I mean, everybody speaks it, so they must be must be doing something right. But it, it, when you look at the way that we just like take a word, shave off all the accents, but still pronounce it the same way, and just expect people to know it and roll with it, is almost the arrogance is almost staggering. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty English to me. Conquer yeah. half of the known world. Well, you get to decide what words are now. <laughs> Yeah, but like resume should have accents on the e's yeah, to really make it should. sound like resume. But they were just like, nope, we don't put that shit on our letters. That's that's too much work. God damn it, we got no time for yeah. this. They'll just know. Yeah. So, <laughs> funny story. When I was in grade school, like elementary, I remember um, we had to do this writing thing. You know, you'd write out a sentence or a paragraph, and every. Every sentence you fucked up, you'd have to go to the back of your, like, booklet, and you'd have to fill the page with that sentence over and over and over again. And as, like, a like an 8 or 10-year-old, filling an entire booklet page of, like, 30 or 40 lines was, like, agonizing. And I fucked up so many sentences that I got to the point where I would, like, cheat it quotes. So mm -hmm. it's like, like, the sentence was, oh, I don't know. I am a very tall boy who likes chocolate. Okay, let's say it's that. And I wrote that in the paragraph, and I wrote it wrong, so now I have to write the sentence over and over and over again and fill an entire page. So I would go, I would go down each line uh, vertically, and I would write I, 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 and I'd go back to the top after that was done and go am, 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 and I'd go back to the top. Uh, and I would just keep doing that until the sentence was done. <laughs> Hey. And then I had to like present it to so I could get signed off to see like oh you spelt the thing and the the teacher's assistant lady or whatever was like that's not how people write you didn't write this properly it's like you gotta do it all over again I'm like this is fucking bullshit I'm gonna go for recess I'm eight <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus that's, that's what I remember of it nah, I think that was grade four so, ah, well, I was probably nine like I'm an idiotic kid why the fuck would I ever want to do lines. And why would I ever want to do lines properly? Like, I'm a lazy bastard who will find a way to speed something up. There's a... <laughs> There's a double meaning there that I, I shouldn't <laughs> give space to, but, like, I was a dumb kid who wanted to do lines, just not at school. Um, but I'm not gonna um, elaborate on that any further. Um, but I couldn't resist, but <laughs> That's a good yeah, one. I don't know. But so the way that you did it though, sounds like that would be satisfying in the same way that like coloring in a big space and something is satisfying. Yeah. You know? It was just like, I have to fill this. Oh, okay. Like I understood the assignment. I had to fill every line with the sentences. I did that. Yeah. I did spell it out. Like. As you properly I mean, who, who's <laughs> this person? The sequence police looking at, like, how you're writing this oh, stuff Oh, well, so it would, like, it was kind of obvious that I, like, wrote the first four like you normally would if you're writing on a piece of lined paper. And then after that, you could tell because um, the angle of the words didn't line up anymore. Like, if you wrote it over mm -hmm. and over again, like, it all started to, like, shift over, like, and kind of <laughs> drift after That's a while. Good. Oh, it'll do it. Yeah, so it was, it was kind of obvious because you're like, well, this just drifted. 
<laughs> this, this is all I remember about this whole thing, because I just remember, like, being told I had to go do it again. I was just like, oh, god damn it. No. That's the way it goes. <laughs> Should we end it there on my on my terrible writing story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I necessarily have anywhere else to go with, with the podcast tonight, so I suppose that's a logical end point. Cool. We'll come back. I guess, well, for us next week, for everyone else, two weeks from now, <laughs> we'll figure yeah. something else to talk about. Hopefully. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's probably another topic in here we could probably do. Uh, there's got to be something. I don't know. Uh, Vanguard moves. <laughs> something. Do you have to go know. find a Vanguard and talk about the Vanguard program so I have an idea what the hell it's supposed to do? Let's get Chat GPT to oh, make God. up something about conquest that doesn't exist, and then talk about it like it's real. We could do that on the April Fools episode. Oh my God! No, <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's definitely something that um, we could do. <laughs> we could we could try and gaslight people that it's an actual thing. Oh my God. Yeah, just destroy all of our credibility. <laughs> what credibility? Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> fuck it, let's go nuts. Yeah, it's our it's our April Fool's episode. We do whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> okay, and with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in and listening to this travesty, and I hope everyone has a great day. Yep. Yeah, have a good night, everybody. Bye!